Uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, today we will be uh, discussing the final four topics um, in the advanced uh, electric drives course. Uh, we will follow the same format we did uh, yesterday, where we'll play a video for each topic, and then we we'll look at some simulations. And uh, if anybody has any questions at any time, just uh, post in the chat, and uh, I'll get to it right away. Uh, so these are uh, four uh, topics that we'll be covering today. So the first one will be um, doubly fed induction generator or motor uh, and its uh, vector control. And the second topic would be space vector PWM. And the third topic would be our direct torque control, which would use the space vector PWM um, uh, control to do what exactly our vector control did, but with a different method. And uh, we'll finally end it with uh, vector control of a permanent magnet synchronous motor. And each of these videos are around 15 to 20 minutes. And uh, after each of those videos, we'll uh, look at uh, doing simulation of uh, whatever we learned in the video. And that would last for like around uh, 30 to 45 minutes each. Um, uh, so we should be done with all the four topics before our lunch break at around 11, 30, 12. And uh, once we come back from lunch break, Professor Mohan would take over and uh, he would do a summary of what all we learned in the past three days. So without any further delay, uh, let me just start off with the first topic, which is going to be uh, vector control of doubly fed induction generator. So in this chapter, we will look at the So in this chapter, we will look at a dynamic analysis of doubly fed induction generators and their vector control. So we see the schematic of a doubly fed induction generator here, dfig in short, uh, where stator is directly connected to the grid, uh, perhaps through a transformer, which is not shown. And uh, then there is uh, uh, power electronics uh, in the rotor circuit that supplies uh, slip frequency currents to the rotor windings. <clears throat> and in this case, both power and reactive power are taken to be entering the, the machine. So here's a, a schematic of six windings. Uh, in this case, uh, three rotor windings are actual. Uh, you know, they are windings, unlike in the squirrel cage machines, where they were representing the squirrel cage. So here we have uh, this uppercase letter representing the, the rotor windings, and then the, the lowercase a representing the stator winding. <clears throat> okay. So why use DFIG? Well, they have certain advantages that uh, they can control speed over a sufficiently wide range in uh, wind applications to operate the turbine at its maximum optimum coefficient of performance. Uh, the steer is directly connected to the grid and uh, only the rotor is supplied to power electronics. That is approximately one third of the rated power of the wind turbine. And reactive power supplied to the rotor is controllable and is amplified on the steer side. So that's a major advantage of uh, defects that they can supply and draw a reactive power from the stator side. Uh, but the major disadvantage of defects is that uh, is the periodic maintenance required of slip rings and brushes. So uh, how do we understand the operation of uh, defect? Well, first of all, we look at uh, uh, these windings and D and Q axis. And here we'll align once again D axis with the rotor flux as we have done uh, in previous chapters. When I say flux, we are talking about flux linkage. <clears throat> so, and these uh, stator and rotor currents are shown only for definition purposes. So here's the D axis, and here's the Q axis, and then, uh, I'm sorry. So it's. Uh, I'm not sure what I have to do here. Uh, 
discard continue recording okay so anyway we will we'll get back to it so here uh, continue recording here so i have to do something here uh, add ins and start recording i'm not sure what i have to do here david i okay so i hope it's uh, still recording <laughs> okay all right uh, assuming that it's still recording otherwise we'll redo it so here we have uh, d and q access and it shouldn't have happened maybe i pressed the wrong thing button here on this uh, stylus q, d and q access again that thing is happening but uh, but here we see that on the D-axis, as we have discussed earlier, we have a rotor and stator D windings, and on the Q-axis, uh, stator, stator and rotor uh, Q-axis windings here. All right, so uh, having aligned uh, the D-axis to the rotor flux linkage, and record, in here I forgot to mention that uh, we are assuming that all the resistances are zero, and all the leakage inductances in the rotor and the stator are zero, and uh, and this is in steady state. So, uh, with those uh, under those conditions, you can see that the rotor flux linkage is equal to the stator flux linkage in the d axis, and similarly in the q axis here. Okay, <clears throat> so having uh, said all that, uh, you know that since uh, uh, lambda sq is zero, uh, the d axis aligned with the, the rotor flux linkage. Uh, uh, we can say that uh, all the DDT terms, first of all, are zero because this is in steady state, right? So you can see that VSD is given by this expression here, but it's equal to zero because VSQ is zero. And then uh, VSQ, uh, lambda sq is zero, I should say. And then uh, VSQ is given by this expression here. And since that's all there is in the, uh, in the stator, uh, we can relate this VSQ to the voltage that we apply uh, in terms of this uh, stator voltage space vector. Where VS hat is the amplitude of the stator voltage space vector. Here, you should come confirm all these things here. And the VSD is equal to zero, right? That is uh, the expression above. So from here, we can uh, then we can calculate, uh, I express flux linkages and currents in the, in the D-axis, uh, these two are equal, and uh, we know from the expression above that uh, Vsq over omega D is equal to omega Sd or S, and uh, that is, uh, and this is constant because this applied voltage is constant, and we're operating in steady state, so the synchronous speed uh, of the speed of the d-axis is constant, omega d. And then, uh, you know, um, these two flux linkages are equal, and they're equal, they're being generated by these two currents, ISD and IRD, they're both acting on the d-axis through a magnetizing inductance, L sub m, and uh, once again, we're assuming that the number of turns in the rotor are the same as the number of turns in the stator, okay? So uh, we can rewrite this expression in terms of ISD being lambda SD over LM minus IRD, and we'll define this quantity here, lambda SD over LM to be the magnetizing induct uh, current IMD here, as given by this expression here. Okay, and then we move on to Q axis, and where we see that, uh, of course, this, uh, Q axis flux linkage is zero. And uh, <clears throat> since uh, lambda SQ and lambda RQ are equal to these two currents uh, acting on the Q axis, and that's equal to zero, and therefore we can derive the expression between ISQ and IRQ. They're equal and opposite in sign over here. And we can write the expression for this space vector for this stator current in DQ reference frame as given by this equation here. All right, <clears throat> then we move on to the rotor voltages. And here we see that, uh, uh, again, DDT terms are zero, and lambda RQ is zero, therefore VRD is equal to zero. And uh, VRQ is given by this expression, uh, DDT zero and 
resistance uh, drop is zero. So VRQ can be written as uh, omega dA is nothing but uh, the slip times uh, omega d, right? So that being the case, we can rewrite VRQ in this form here. And now we can calculate the power inputs on this from the st uh, to the stator and to the rotor, both real and reactive power. So uh, PS plus JQS uh, is uh, the voltage uh, times the conjugate of the current. And therefore, this negative sign comes in here because of the conjugate. And if uh, this term is zero, and if you multiply these two uh, quantities within the brackets, we get this expression here, then equating real and imaginary parts, we can see that the power uh, being supplied to the stator is given by this expression here, and the power, reactive power being supplied to the stator is given by this expression. The same thing we can do on the rotor side, where uh, you know PR plus JQR are given by the voltage times the current conjugate, and because the conjugate, this negative sign here, and then you multiply these quantities here, recognizing that this is zero, uh, we get uh, this for the rotor power and this for the rotor reactive power. So there is an external circuit connected to rotor windings uh, that can supply or sink uh, these powers and reactive power. Okay, <clears throat> and so similarly, we can write uh, the equation for electromagnetic torque uh, again, recognizing that VRQ is equal to zero, it simplifies to this expression here. And we can also see the relationship between the stator and rotor. Uh, real power is given by this, recognizing that PS plus PR is equal to P shaft. That's the electromagnetic power that is being delivered to the shaft. <clears throat> okay, so it's, uh, you know, taken to be going out of the shaft to something external connected to that. So that's really the convention of defining uh, P shaft here. And then uh, for the reactive power, uh, we can uh, uh, again uh, <clears throat> make, you the, make use of the equations beforehand that we have derived and it turns out to be this. And this part here, we'll call it the magnetizing reactive power here. And this is the contribution to the stator from the uh, from the rotor, and you can see this uh, rotor reactive power is amplified because S is generally, you know, uh, less than points zero three or less than three uh, percent or something like that. But in this case, in defects, it could be larger. But whatever, it's a it's a small quantity. Uh, this is probably true of uh, squirrel cage induction machines. But here we can operate at uh, larger values of uh, S, but uh, nevertheless, it's, a, it's, a, it's less than one for sure, but much less than one, and therefore, the power supplied, uh, reactive power supplied to the rotor is amplified, okay? So that's, uh, as we mentioned, uh, one of the advantages of, uh, of DFIG here. Okay, so, so now let's uh, move on to this example here. Uh, just to give an idea as to what uh, this DFIG uh, can do, first of all, it's taken to be operating at a motoring mode, and it's uh, that and that means and it's operating at a subsynchronous speed. So it's operating as a motor and at a subsynchronous speed, and uh, <clears throat> it's at a lagging power factor. That means its uh, Q sub S is being drawn from the grid. And what we are asked here is to calculate the signs of various quantities in this mode of operation. So again, there is no secret here uh, in terms of uh, der deriving these expressions. The slip speed is positive, slip is positive, electromagnetic torque based on the, uh, the direction in which we define electromagnetic torque going out of the shaft. This is a motor after all, so it's positive. And then, uh, it's drawing power from the stator that turns out to be positive, and the current ISQ is positive from this expression. You can see that omega D is positive and uh, lambda SD is positive. And so ISQ is definitely positive <coughs> if uh, this is acting as a motor. It's drawing power from the stator. And so ISQ is positive and therefore 
uh, IRQ is negative. And then we can substitute that into this expression here. And you can see this is again positive and ISD from this expression here, because this is positive and this is positive, this ISD is positive as well here. And uh, <clears throat> we can do the same thing for the, the rotor circuit and uh, uh, calculate, maybe I'll play this trick here and amplify it here, that uh, this uh, rotor power is, uh, see it uh, doesn't work my pen in this mode here. <laughs> so I'll go back. That rotor power, we can calculate that to be uh, uh, negative here because uh, IRQ is negative. So slip is positive, omega D is positive, lambda RD is positive, but IRQ is negative from the previous uh, calculation. So PS is negative. PR is negative, I should say. And uh, QR, uh, we can calculate here and uh, so this sign should be indicated here. And uh, so this should be uh, positive as well, I think. QR, QR should be uh, positive. And uh, <clears throat> then, uh, so here I, IRQ and ISQ, uh, they are related here. That was made use of it over here, right? So IRD is positive here, but it's, uh, is taken to be positive, but uh, caveat is that IRD is less than IMD here. And similarly, we can calculate VRD and VR, VRQ. And once we have uh, these uh, VRD and VRQ, uh, we can calculate what uh, the voltages need to be applied to A, B, and C rotor phase windings. And uh, based on these uh, signs we have computed, we can draw this uh, space vector diagram. So we move on to a second example where dfig is operating in the generator in the generator mode at a super synchronous speed. So here omega m in electrical radians per second is greater than omega d which is the synchronous speed and it's at operating at a lagging power factor leading power factor I should say I should be able to read leading power factor that means it's supplying reactive power to the grid. And then we go through the same uh, arguments and come up with all these signs, which then would result in these uh, space vector diagrams over here. So one, you know, one needs to go through these and see that uh, everything is uh, correct. So here, uh, you know, we what we have shown so far is just the steady state operation and assuming uh, the turns ratio to be the same on the rotor and the stator. However, if there's a turns ratio, uh, one should be able to derive these expressions and that's left as a homework problem, okay? And then, uh, the, but the main emphasis here in doing all this is to be able to show that uh, how we can perform vector control on defects as what we have learned in uh, chapter five, uh, you know, in that case, using a squirrel cage machine. So that is uh, you know, left as, uh, as an example, and it is uh, on the website, and one should go and take a look at it carefully and, you know, put all the pieces together. So thank you very much. Let's see if uh, it's So um, uh, we will now be looking at a simulation for uh, the vector control of a doubly fed induction generator. So as you saw in the video, uh, Professor had given all the equations to be able to control the stator of, uh, if it's a generator, to be able to control the power, real power that's being fed into the generator, as well as reactive power that's either being fed or drawn uh, from the grid. So uh, uh, in the vector control model that we are going to be seeing right now, uh, we are going to look into designing the uh, DQ model, which is going to be exactly the same as what we have done for the squirrel cage motor, induction motor, but the only difference is there we made the rotor voltage is zero.
uh, in this case we are going to control the rotor voltage so that uh, we can control uh, either the real power that's being fed uh, into the grid and the reactor power that's being fed or drawn from the grid or, or we could control the speed of the generator and then again the reactor power so you can control any two parameters any two uh, independent parameters so in, in the example that we are going to be looking at uh, we are going to be uh, controlling the current uh, irb drawn by the rotor which in turn can be uh, linked to the reactor power being drawn or fed into the grid uh, and the second parameter that we are going to control is the rotor speed and the reason we are going to be controlling the rotor speed is uh, the example that we are going to look at is for an induction uh, uh, doubly fed induction generator um a, a megawatt uh, actual generator that was deployed by siemens so we are going to use those parameters and simulate the generator operation and uh, these are used usually in wind turbines um uh, because uh, if you use the squirrel cage motor uh, there would be a limitation on the uh, range of speed that you can operate in and uh, if you can if you use because it goes below sub synchronous speed uh, you won't be able to generate any power uh, as opposed to dfig where we'll see even in sub synchronous speed you can generate real uh, power and feed it to the grid uh, so that's one limitation of uh, single single fed induction generator that we want to do away with Uh, so we go to doubly fed induction generator for a wind turbine and uh, th there are a lot of cases recently uh, that use permanent magnet synchronous motor instead of doubly fed um, because uh, they are more compact and uh, not as heavy as a doubly fed induction generator since these are mounted on top of a uh, nacel so far up uh, it's easy if it's uh, lower in weight uh, but uh, the problem with uh, synchronous uh, motors are that you need magnets which are really expensive and the other bigger problem is there these magnets tend to be brittle uh, and uh, especially given that uh, there's a significant amount of vibration going on in a wind turbine they could easily crack a magnet at those vibration if they are not mounted properly so they require a lot of expensive procedure to mount them and uh, more care compared to dfig which is much more uh, rugged so uh, let's look at uh, the simulation for doubly fit again this file we will make available um on the saw website of uh, course so uh these are the parameters of the induction motor um doubly fit induction motor this again um a standard a, a grid deployed uh induction motor uh, data sheet that we got uh, from siemens that we are just using uh to do the simulation and uh this was the same model that we used uh, in most of our simulations yesterday that we did in matlab uh to show uh, in that case the only thing that we did was made the rotor short circuited uh instead of uh, it being able to control the voltage so that was the only difference but we used the same parameters so so here is the motor model and if you look under the motor model it's exactly the same uh you have the only difference is the rotor voltage is we made it to be zero so this part of uh, flrdq we computed flrd by solve uh, yeah flrd the rotor d axis flux linkage by solving the equation and the q axis flux linkage we set it to zero for um, uh, vector control because we align the dq axis with uh, the rotor d axis so the q axis flux would have been zero uh, but as mentioned uh, professor mentioned in his video uh, it's preferred to align the dq axis uh, when doing vector control for dfig with the rotor uh, the applied uh, grid voltage and there are two reasons for this uh, the so first reason is uh, as we will look at the equations later uh, it makes the equation it simplifies the e controller equation so that you can decouple it much more easily so that one of the loops control the real power and the other one controls the reactor power and the decoupling terms are somewhat limited compared to other uh, alignments and the other uh, advantage you get with aligning with rotor voltage as professor mentioned is that it is easy to measure so if you align it with your rotor flux then uh, you, you the only parameter that you can measure is the rotor voltage and you need an estimator model to uh, estimate the slip speed and add that to the measured rotor voltage to get the position of the rotor flux the speed of the rotor flux integrate to get the position so and you need ex extremely accurate uh, rotor model as uh, the motor model to be able to have a estimator which estimates the position correctly so any discrepancies would cause a significant reduction in performance as we saw in the uh, detuning uh, the uh, last video that we saw yesterday where when we changed the resistance by half uh, 
you can see the current ratio starts to change. Uh, there's more current being drawn or lesser current being drawn uh, than what is expected. So to avoid all of those, uh, if you can, if, since we only know the grid voltage, it's pretty stable sinusoidal. Uh, so you can just put uh, two voltage sensor, measure the voltage, and from that you can get your uh, third voltage and then estimate the angle mm -hmm. quite precisely. So that would eliminate the need for an estimator model. So that's the second advantage of co-measuring, aligning with the state voltage. So because we aligned with state voltage, we need to estimate the D and Q axis flux. The Q axis flux will not be zero anymore, the rotor Q axis. So uh, I, I won't go into the details of this model because it's very much similar to the induction motor DQ model that we uh, went over in detail yesterday. So let me skip that part. And um, so the other part that we have here uh, is your PI controller for controlling your rotor currents. So if you look at this here, you have your stator voltage, uh, which is your uh, three phase uh, uh, coming from your three phase grid. And uh, if you look at what the value we set for the state voltage. So let's just run the simulation so that we can get the values. So if you see the magnitude, it's set at uh, 375 volts peak uh, per phase. And uh, you have all the three phases shifted, uh, each of it by 120 degree. So the stator is directly connected to the grid. You're not doing any form of, uh, you do not have any power electronics on the stator side, you could. Uh, but as we'll see once we run the simulation, look at the results, it's much more advantage uh, in a DFIG uh, uh, because you can use uh, you, you can use the power electronics on the rotor, which would reduce the amount of power handled by the power electronics. So that's the other advantage that you can't get with either a singly fed induction uh, generator or permanent magnet synchronous motor because the power electronics will be on the stator. That's the only option. And it sees the complete whole power that's being uh, delivered by the generator. But in a, a doubly fed induction generator, you put the power electronics on the rotor, which reduces the power seen by the power electronic unit uh, while offering significant amount of uh, speed control. So um, you, so we apply constant uh, stator voltages from the grid and then the rotor voltage we are controlling by means of power electronics. So the power electronic unit, we are just assuming it to be a one is to one block here. And what we are doing is we have two inner current loop controls, same as what we did yesterday for vector control of induction generator, induction motor. And uh, the Q axis current controller, we extended by an additional loop to convert the current control to speed control. Uh, and the reason we are doing speed control here is because when in, in, an, uh, in an induction, uh, in a wind turbine, you would ideally want to control the speed of the rotor turbine, uh, the turbine, because um, there are certain points for a given wind speed there is one particular turbine speed which uh, absorbs the maximum amount of energy that's in the wind, uh, that's being delivered by the wind. So, uh, and th these are called CP uh, coefficient curves and you can look at the curve and then estimate the exact value of speed uh, depending on the wind speed that would produce the maximum uh, amount of power. So, uh, and it, 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 it might be a bit counterintuitive uh, because we would, uh, in, if, if we uh, were to, ask someone, the answer would be higher the speed, uh, more the amount of power, but that's not the case. There is one optimal power which is in between uh, and either extremes the power starts to drop off significantly. So you would want to operate at that particular speed based on the turbine characteristic, each turbine have different characteristic. Based on that there is one particular speed for a given wind speed that will be the optimal. So we are going to be doing speed control. And um, if you look at the equations, uh, the DQ equations are exactly the same as what we had yesterday. The only difference is uh, VRD, VRQ, uh, when we did for single fed induction, uh, uh, squirrel cage, sorry, squirrel cage induction uh, motor, uh, we made VRD and VRQ zero. But in this case, it's not gonna be zero. These two are gonna be the control voltages. And uh, in uh, squirrel cage, we had uh, VSD and VSQ as the control variables, but here it's no longer under our control. It's gonna be directly connected to the grid. So grid is gonna set those voltages. And uh, since we have aligned our D and Q axis with a DQ frame uh, with uh, your stator applied voltage, your VSQ component is now going to be zero. Uh, and the stator applied voltage uh, is going to be have only the VSD component. It's same as when we aligned your uh, rotor flux along uh, the axis, you had your VR, uh, your, your, you had your uh, flux rotor D axis alone present and your rotor flux Q axis had no component on it. So the same principle extends here as well. So uh, based on the equations that Professor had given, you can 
just extend them or simplify them just kind of uh, play around with those equations a little bit and uh, you should be able to establish a transfer function that directly links your d axis current uh, rotor d axis current with your applied rotor d axis voltage and you'll get the same equation on by sl plus r uh, sigma sl plus r uh, and you can um, but all of these r and l are the rotor quantities and similarly you could get a transfer function that links um, let me see here uh, that links your q axis current uh, your yeah so your that links your q axis current with your uh, rotor speed so that would just be some kd factor divided by js again this transfer function can be derived quite easily so it look so from the torque equation that should be straightforward and in the torque equation you have this lm ll uh, lambda sd and um, since you have connected your stator directly to the grid and if you neglect your leakage inductance stator leakage inductance and your stator resistance you can see the magnetizing inductance is directly connected to the grid voltage if you ignore both the leakages a leakage and the stator resistance so the since the grid voltage is fixed the magnetizing current in the the dfig is going to be fixed which means the magnetizing flux component or lambda is the component is also going to be fixed or it's not going to vary significantly so you can assume this to be a constant and lm and ls are constant p by 2 is a constant so this whole term becomes a constant so the torque is just a function of your q axis current rotor q axis current so you adjust your q axis current you should be able to adjust torque and in turn adjust the uh, speed as well so that's what we have done here and uh, uh, tuning the pi values again i won't go into the details of it because the model is exactly same as what we saw yesterday uh, so there is no uh, complication there so let's go ahead and run this model uh, before i do that let's look at what the uh, stator voltage is uh, so it's line to line rms 460 so if you find out the peak voltage that was what we saw there it would come out to 375 So this is like a grass standard grid voltage, and uh, if you look at the uh, applied frequency again, it's uh, the US North America frequency, which is a uh, 60 hertz standard. So it's, it's directly connected to the stator without any additional power electronics in between. Uh, it's directly connected to the grid. So uh, let's go ahead and oh, I, and the speed at which we are running this uh, motor right now. So this is the Omega sync, and uh, as I mentioned yesterday, um, when there is no load. uh since this is a really high power uh, generator about a megawatt or higher uh the slip speed is going to be really really small under no load uh, because if it, it, uh, depending on the motor's uh, power level uh the slip profile torque versus slip becomes more and more steep at higher power generally that's how they design it uh else there would be significant amount of losses uh and that would cause a lot of heating which cannot be managed at higher power levels so that's the reason they make it more and more uh slow uh higher and higher as you go to higher power levels anyway getting back to this so your uh wind speed omega m would be very close to omega sync uh if at no load and as we will see this value comes out to around 125 radians per second for a six pole uh motor so you could calculate by 120 fyp and then that will give you an rpm converted to radians per second so uh that would come to 125 radians per second and uh, let's go ahead run this model So right now we are running this whole thing as a motor. You can just flip it around and run it as a generator. It's all one and the same. So let's look at what the speed value is. So the speed, oh yeah. So the initial values are close to 125. Uh, if it was uh, zero slip, you'd have got a little bit over 125 because there's a small amount of slip. You get uh, the actual speed at no load would be 124. so we are start, we are assuming that it's already at steady state uh, rotating at 124 radians per second at no load and uh, what we are doing is uh, sorry at at a very small load that uh, sorry rated load that we are putting here and what we are doing is at about 1 second we are reducing the reference speed uh, by 1/4 so we are asking the motor to rotate at 75 percentage of its rated speed so again uh, we would be doing this if uh, say your wind speed were to reduce you are previously operating at a certain uh, speed uh, and your wind speed now reduced a little bit so you would want to reduce your turbine speed as well uh, by as determined by the cp curve uh, so that you take ma- mo- uh, as much power as possible from the wind so there is a theoretical limit uh, as to how much power you can draw from the wind uh, and uh, i think that's about 57 percentage that's the theoretical limit and uh, most uh, practical wind turbines would have a much lower limit than that they can't even uh, It, it, so theoretically, it's 57% limit, and practical 
would be like 30 percent or uh, the lower or a little bit lesser than that so it definitely can't absorb all 57 percentages that's theoretically possible either so uh, depending on that uh, we, we would have required to reduce the speed and um, if you look at the waveforms here so first let's look at the speed it's initially at 124 and then for some reason the turbine determines that it needs to run at a lower speed uh, and the reason would most likely be because the wind speed changed and uh, you go to a lower operating speed. So as you can see, the vector control uh, performs exactly as you need, uh, as you want. And uh, the, the interesting thing is, it's the same equation that dictates everything. Uh, but when we did in, uh, induction, the squirrel cage induction motor, the stator parameters control the speed, uh, the stator voltages. And here we had the same equations, we just flipped them around so that the rotor voltages can control the speed. So both of them can control uh, either of them can control uh, the speed and the currents. So now let's uh, look at what the rotor currents would be. So it should be almost uh, close to DC or close to zero frequency sign when there is no load. And once you add load, uh, as the uh, slips starts increasing, you're going to see a higher frequency uh, in your uh, rotor currents. And if you look at your stator currents, it's going to be always at grid frequency. So let me let it run. All right. So, so respect of what uh, position it's in transient steady state, it's always going to be a good frequency, which is 60 hertz. And uh, finally, uh, let's look at the rotor voltage and the stator voltage. So this is where uh, the advantage of putting uh, a DFIG over a permanent magnet synchronous motor, other than of course the magnet being an issue, which is expensive, and the supply is not reliable. Uh, and it's very brittle. So in addition in, in addition to all those uh, uh, limitations which are avoided in uh, DFIG, you get the advantage that we look at right now. So if you see the voltage, uh, uh, state voltage, it's going to be, it's about uh, 375 volts. Uh, it's exactly 375 volts peak. And if you look at the state of currents, uh, it's about, uh, what is this value around, th let's say 2000 maybe. Uh, let's just do a hand waving calc. How much power is being so? Let's not worry if it's real reactive power. Let's just uh, take the apparent power. So the peak is um, 2000, and then the voltage was what 375. So these are all peak. So we need to divide it by root two root two. That will give you two. So that's your uh, per phase uh, single phase power multiplied by three. So this is a megawatt generator. So as you can see the power being uh, uh, drawn by the motor, we are operating it as a motor just for this example, but the power being drawn is about 1.125 megawatt in the stator, uh, apparent power, uh, megawatt. Uh, so uh, what we are gonna now look at next is your, what's your power being drawn by your uh, rotor circuit. So if you look at the voltage of the rotor circuit, it peaks at about 90. And if you look at the rotor current, uh, that peaks a little bit about 2000 ampere again. So if you go back to, so the same formula, let's do 2000 into, what was the voltage? I think it was 90. And then you divide it by root two root two to convert it to RMS and then multiply by three for all three phases. So if you see that it's only 270 uh, kilowatt, so let's round it up to 300 kilowatt. So that's close to, that's just one third of the power that's flowing through the stator. So this is where this uh, major advantage of uh, the DFIG comes in, which is that the power seen by the rotor is close to just one third uh, the power seen by the stator circuit. So you get this uh, to, the, to the same, almost the same extent of control in the speed and the reactor power that you would if you had the power electronics on the stator instead of the rotor, but uh, the power electronics on the rotor only needs to handle one third of the power. So you could use uh, really, really uh, cheap switches, uh, save a lot on the power electronics, save a lot of space. And uh, the other big advantage is that you don't have to worry about significant thermal heating because thermal heating would have been cut down by one third proportionally uh, here. And uh, the other big advantage here is uh, you cannot uh, tinker too much with your uh, state voltage. Uh, you could put a huge transformer in the front end uh, if you want to change the state voltage to a lower voltage. 
uh, but that would be more expensive. But in case of DFIG, you, you can control the turns ratio of the rotor and reduce the rotor voltage significantly so that your power electronics can operate at a much, much lower voltage. Uh, so these are the advantages that you would get with going with the DFIG. And uh, this is pretty much uh, the stator control, uh, the vector control of a double fed induction generator. So the last uh, point that I wanted to visit before we move on to the next topic is uh, if you take a look at the uh, state voltage. So what is the phase sequence of the applied state voltage? So let's zoom in a little bit. And the color coding is red first, green, blue. So if you look at this, this is red is A phase, uh, green is uh, blue, uh, B phase, and the blue is uh, C phase. So that's uh, A, B, and C, 120 degree. So it's a positive sequence because A comes first, B, then C next, the peak of it. And if you look at what happens to the rotor voltage, um, it's the same sequence, I would assume, let's, but let's verify. So it's again the same thing, uh, red first, yep, green second, blue. So it's A phase, B phase, and C phase. So it's again positive sequence. So this is what happens when it runs at uh, below the synchronous speed in motoring mode. So uh, in this case, what's gonna happen is your rotor uh, flux, act, uh, your rotor uh, flux space vector is gonna, uh, so your stator flux space vector is gonna lead your rotor flux space vector. And that causes a motoring torque or a positive torque that uh, pulls the rotor uh, along the direction of rotation of the flux. Uh, so, and uh, now what would happen if we were to increase the speed uh, rather than reducing the speed below synchronous, let's increase the speed above synchronous. So if this were, this was a squirrel cage motor, if the rotor speed was to be set above the synchronous speed, it just would not be possible. Like if you, if you are applying only 60 Hertz uh, voltage, you cannot get uh, above 125 radians per second using a squirrel cage on a six fold uh, motor. It's just not feasible if you have just 60 Hertz fixed voltage or you apply, you can change the voltage magnitude, but the frequency always needs to be below 60. The speed is upper limit is always fixed, but that's not the case with the synchronous uh, the double fed induction generator. Even though the mechanical speed or the synchronous speed uh, is at 125 radians per second, uh, your rotor speed can be much higher than that and still operate at motoring mode. So let's look at that. In a the single if, uh, in a squirrel cage, it would have gone to generating mode at higher speeds than synchronous, but in a uh, doubly fed, you can still have it in motoring mode. So how does uh, it do this? So first let's look at the mechanical speed and see if it kept. So it was 125 and I changed the reference to 1.25 times 125. So that settles to about 156, uh, give or take plus or minus two. So, um, but uh, how, so how does it do that? If you look at the stator voltage again, it is gonna be the same sequence. There's a lot of data points. So it takes a couple of seconds to uh, refresh it. So if you look at the stator voltage, it's the same sequence because it's connected to the grid voltage. It's fixed, we didn't uh, tinker around with that value. So this was a constant, uh, there was a sign source block that we didn't tinker. So it's gonna be the same. So if you look at the sequence, it's again A, B, C, positive sequence. But the interesting part is if you look at the rotor voltage, it would have gone to negative sequence. So if you look at that, it's red first, blue second, and green third. So it's A phase, then B, uh, then C phase, then uh, B phase. So here it was A, B, C, but uh, here it has become A, C, B. So it's gone to negative sequence. So what this is basically doing is your rotor is actually now rotating faster than the synchronous speed. So you're inducing the current induced on the rotor uh, the current being uh, pushed into the rotor by the power electronic unit would now go from positive to negative sequence so that the vector with respect to the rotor axis, the current space vector and the flux rotor flux space vector with respect to the rotor axis, if you had to hold the rotor and see what uh, direction in which the flux is rotating, instead of going counterclockwise, as it would have with its case of positive sequence, it now starts rotating in the clockwise direction. So the rotor is rotating at counterclockwise direction at a speed faster than synchronous speed and the produced flux vectors are a little bit rotating in the counterclockwise with respect to the rotor. So the combined effect is that the motor, uh, the rotor flux space vector uh, would, due to the effect of the rotor rotating faster and this flux space vector rotating in the opposite direction, the combined effect would be that the rotor space vector seen with respect to the stator A phase winding would now rotate at synchronous speed, lagging behind the applied stator voltage, uh, stator flux space vector.
So that's how you are able to maintain a synchronous speed by inducing this uh, opposite uh, negative sequence currents into your rotor, uh, still be able to continue in motoring mode. And the same thing was what happens when you go to a generation mode or generator mode of operation, where uh, you have a generator and your rotor speed is, uh, say, above the synchronous speed. That is all fine, even a squirrel cage can operate at a synchronous mode at that point. But now, say, your wind speed starts to reduce and there is no way of controlling the voltage applied directly from the grid. Uh, so there is no way of applying, uh, controlling the frequency. You can't change the synchronous speed and your wind speed changes you would want to operate at the optimal power level. So you want to re reduce your turbine speed. You want to reduce your rotor speed. But uh, in a squirrel cage, if you reduce the rotor speed below synchronous speed, you can no longer generate it, goes into motoring mode. So what you, but in a doubly fed induction generator, you this is called subsynchronous generator mode. You can go at a speed lesser than the synchronous speed. The rotor can rotate at lesser speed, but the uh, sequence of current injected would flip over uh, from positive to negative sequence so that it can still uh, lead the applied stator uh, flux, the rotor flux, so that it can uh, generate power and feed it back into the, the supply. And the last thing that I wanted to mention was, um, you can, in addition to controlling the speed, you can also control the amount of uh, reactor power that you uh, inject into the grid. Uh, but again, this can be done by even a uh, uh, single squirrel cage induction generator, as well as permanent magnet synchronous motor. As long as you have a power electronics, the power electronics can uh, supply or absorb any amount of, uh, not any amount, uh, reactive power, which is going to be limited by the real power. So if your real power is going to be zero, you can't uh, have any amount of reactive power being flown either. But if you have some amount of real power, you can control the reactive power proportionally. So there is some limit, but you can control. So you can make the generator uh, look as if it's uh, consuming reactive power or it is uh, giving back reactive power. Uh, this is only possible because of the power electronics uh, present. If it's not, if there is no power electronics and you have a school cage directly connected to the grid, then it's always going to draw reactive power because it's going to need magnetizing current, which is inductance, which is going to draw reactive power. Um, so with that, uh, I'll end the simulation and uh, we will look at the next topic, which is going to be uh, space vector PWM. And once we are done with it, we'll again look at uh, simple simulation, uh, which we do in the lab to uh, as I think the sixth experiment. So let's go ahead and get started on that video now. So in this chapter, we will look at space vector. So in this chapter, we will look at space vector PWM of inverters in uh, three phase applications. So advantages are that uh, we utilize the DC bus uh, fully without any hardware addition, just the controller is different. And it has the same simplicity as the carrier modulated PWM. And we have seen sign modulated uh, uh, PWM before. And uh, also it's very applicable in vector control, DTC and V over F control. So it, ha it has all the advantages. So let's uh, start with uh, our basic uh, a three phase uh, switch mode inverter where we have a DC bus and we have three bipositional switches. And uh, then we know how to define the, the space vector in terms of uh, the three voltages that get applied across the phases of these three windings. And uh, we use uh, A axis as the reference axis. And that's why the superscript A over here. But uh, you know we may keep it or not keep it. It's up to us. But uh, how can we define these voltages, uh, VA, VB, and VC, in terms of voltages uh, of the, these poles? For example, A with respect to this uh, negative DC point N, VAN, and uh, but there's a you know there's a difference between VA and VA and VAN, and that is uh, additional voltage VN which is the, the voltage of this point with respect to, let's say this hypothetically is neutral, uh, is grounded here. But you don't have ground it, we could have said little, little n, and we could have written it that way. But nevertheless, uh, each volt, phase voltage VA, VB, and VC can be defined in terms of the pole voltages and the, the voltage of this negative DC bus over here. And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, we know that uh, 
you know, the, uh, the sum of these three uh, quantities, uh, exponentials, is equal to zero. So if we write, uh, you know, in this equation above for VA, VB, and VC in this form, and uh, we are, you know, uh, multiplying each of these voltages by this uh, axis orientations over here and uh, applying this equation over here, we can see that uh, space vector we end up with is in terms of uh, pole voltages here. And what are the pole voltages? Well, that's the DC bus voltage times the switching signal Q sub A, which takes on two values. It's one when the switch is up, and it's zero when it's down. So if you do that, then uh, we can also write uh, the space voltage, um, um, voltage space vector in terms of uh, this DC input times these uh, uh, switching signals here. All right, so having done that, uh, let's look at what are the basic uh, voltage vectors. At any t given time, uh, we can only get uh, eight states, out of which uh, you know, six are active vectors and uh, two are zero. So here we use kind of a binary notation that uh, when all the three switches are in the down position, we have V0, uh, zero, zero, 0, here, which is really a zero vector here, as shown here. Now here, uh, we see that uh, this A phase, uh, the pole for A is in the up position, then the, for B and C, there's in the down position, so 0, 0, and 1 here. That gives us this V1, uh, space vector, so to speak, which is shown over here, right here. And uh, it is really Vd times e to the j0. And similarly, uh, we can write for other conditions where here uh, B is up, but the other two are zero. We get V2, which is over here, and we have uh, in polar form this note in this expression. And then uh, <clears throat> when you have both uh, B and A up, we get this V3, which is this, and when only four is, uh, when only C is up, and uh, B and C, B and A, I should say, are zero, uh, we get uh, V4, which is over here, and uh, then uh, V5 is when uh, A and C are in the up position, and we get uh, this, and then for V6, uh, we have, you know, B and C are up and A is in the down position and we get uh, uh, this uh, this one over here, okay? So, and uh, then again, I, I shouldn't forget that when all the switches are in the up position, uh, then we get V7, which is again a zero vector because all of them are in the up, up position. So it's like we are putting a short across this inverter just like when we do the here, then all the switches are in the down position, okay? So these uh, V0 and V7 basic, uh, these are the basic vectors. So this is all <clears throat> uh, an inverter can supply, uh, provide at any instant of time. But our goal, and then we can divide this into six sectors, a sector one, which is between this one and this one here, sector two, which is between this one and this one, and so on. And uh, let's say we want to, uh, you know, provide to the machine this uh, uh, space vector, voltage space vector, Vs over here. So how do we do that? Well, we'll take a little bit of this, a little bit of this, and a little bit of both of these zero states over here and uh, achieve this here. So that's what we want to do. And so what, um, so the objective, as I said, is to, achieve uh, uh, desired uh, reference uh, stator voltage space vector. It has to be, we need to keep the switching frequency constant. We want smallest uh, instantaneous deviation from its reference value. Uh, we want to maximize the utilization of the available DC bus. We want to also have the lowest ripple in the motor current and minimize switching loss in the inverter. So all these things uh, kind of, um, are achieved uh, if, um, you know, of course, there may be certain conditions where the, you know, how you synthesize that desired voltage space vector may be different, 
but uh, in general, it's you know it's synthesized by means of two instantaneous basic non-zero vectors that form the sector in which the average voltage space vector is to synthesize. So it's important to note is that this space vector that we are trying to synthesize is really an average over a time period. Okay. Whereas what I was showing you, uh, those were instantaneous. Uh, basic uh, voltage vectors. And we also make use of the zero voltage vectors such that transition causes only one switch status to min to change to minimize the inverter switching loss. So all that would happen as uh, we describe in the switching scheme uh, later. So let's say that our voltage vector average uh, is to be to, is to be synthesized over here. So we can see that uh, you know if you take the projection of this uh, uh, in this way, uh, we are we have to apply this uh, V1 uh, basic uh, voltage vector for an instant uh, for an interval x. We'll apply uh, V3 uh, for an interval y here. So this x and y are these intervals uh, multiplied by the switching time period and then divide by the switching time period over here. And then we have for for Z time T sub S interval, we will apply zero vector. So that's multiplied by zero over here, right? So uh, with this, we can write that uh, this uh, voltage space vector that we are wishing to, uh, to synthesize on an average basis is given by these two over here. And over a switching time period, we can appreciate that x plus y plus z should be equal to one because that's the switching time period. So from here, we could also see that uh, you know this voltage space vector, the average that we are trying to synthesize is written in a polar form like this, and it's equal to this interval x times v1, which is this here, times uh, y, and uh, not times, but plus, I should say, y times uh, V3, which is over here. So this is V1 uh, right here, and this is V3 right here, and we multiply this X and Y. Okay, so the X and Y are unitless uh, quantities here. So this is the case for you know a voltage vector being synthesized in sector one, but uh, that can be done for any other uh, sectors. So that's uh, not not a mystery. But uh, important thing to note is that uh, this the maximum that we can synthesize for this average uh, voltage space vector uh, is given by this expression. Uh, you know, we can write it uh, in this form here. We have to recognize that uh, this uh, maximum, uh, you know, cannot go outside this hexagon and is of constant amplitude as it rotates at uh, synchronous speed. This uh, omega sync over here. So the biggest circle that we can fit in this uh, hexagon, hexagonal space uh, that we have to find. So what is the limit? So the limit occurs right here at uh, 30 degrees from A axis over here, because uh, you know that's really the midpoint over here where the radius uh, is, uh, you may say, the smallest at, compared to any other uh, position of this uh, desired space vector. So we can say that Vs max here is uh, you know, DC bus voltage times uh, you know, cosine of the 30 degrees, which is this value over here. So if that is the maximum that we can get for we, you know, the space vector peak, and we know that the phase maximum peak is uh, two thirds of this here. So we get uh, this value over here. And we can express that in terms of RMS by, this is the phase quantity maximum. So we multiply by square root of three to get the line to line, and then divide by square root of two to get the RMS. So line to line comes by multiplying by square root of three, and uh, dividing it by square root of two gives us the RMS, and that comes out to be 0 0.707 times V sub D. But let's compare that with what happens when we have sine uh, PWM. In sine PWM, the maximum phase voltage can become is VD over two, okay? So to make it line to line, you multiply it by a square root of three, uh, 
So that's the peak, and then you divide by a square of two, then we get this quantity over here. So you can see that uh, making use of uh, pulse width modulation as compared to sine PWM for the same given DC bus voltage, uh, we are able to achieve a higher amplitude of uh, the output AC. So without doing anything, just changing the, the way we control, uh, we are getting this uh, maximum utilization of the DC bus in this uh, three-phase case. Okay, so having said that, uh, how do we implement that? Well, first of all, uh, let's, uh, you know, we can, we can have a table lookup and we can see how we should, uh, in a given sector, what uh, basic space vectors to apply, what zero vectors to apply, and what sequence we should use them, all those things. But, uh, you know, instead of doing all that, we can use uh, what is also done in practice is that we use carrier modulated PWM, just like we do in uh, sine PWM. So, so carrier signal is triangular over here, and uh, you know it is uh, shown to be going uh, positive and negative, whereas in some other books that I have written, I have used it. I have used it as going between zero and positive only. But in this case, uh, so that's kind of a difference uh, that it's go, you know, going from positive peak to the negative peak, this carrier. And then we are controlling uh, the switch, uh, these switches, QA, QB, and QC, by comparing this uh, carrier with some control voltage uh, you know, for these three phases over here, A, B, and C. And uh, we know that uh, you know, we can also derive this that instantaneously uh, you know, sum of all these three voltages is equal to zero. And uh, so what we need to do is to uh, take these voltages uh, that uh, we need to apply to the machine and subtract them with uh, a quantity called V sub K, which is written over here. And I'll describe it in a second and divide by VD over two. And that gives us the control voltage for phase A. So you take this quantity and multiply by V triangular hat, which is right here, which we know, we can get the control voltage for phase A, similarly for B and C. So this is derived, uh, well, it's not derived actually in the textbook, it's left as a homework problem. So what happens is that in this case, this uh, quantity VK, V sub K that we are subtracting from this uh, uh, phase voltages that we have to produce uh, is uh, given by this expression. It's maximum of uh, these three phase voltages plus minimum of these three. So we pick the minimum of these three, we pick the maximum of these three, and divide by two. So, and also uh, here, this Z interval is really, you know, sum of the zero state, uh, well, Z zero, I should say, where we are applying V zeros basic vector and Z7 where we are applying V7 uh, basic vector here. So if you do this comparison of control voltages with the triangular waveform, uh, we get uh, the, the wave pole voltages to be looking like this over here. And you can see that they satisfy the fact that uh, there is only one transition uh, every time the things change over here. So that uh, is, uh, so what we have done is we have taken these two, uh, you know, it automatically happens that uh, z these two zero states are uh, on the, uh, the, the two far sides of the, uh, you know, active vectors, so to speak. And uh, so this is what is done uh, in, uh, in Simulink here. This uh, system is modeled and we see that uh, uh, the control voltages, instead of looking at sinusoidal, uh, which was the case in uh, sine PWM, I look uh, of this waveform over here. So, so that pretty much uh, completes. So uh, let's now uh, look at the simulation of uh, what we learned in this video.
So first, let's uh, look at uh, sine PWM, which is a little bit easier uh, compared to SPPWM. So what we do in sine PWM is we have uh, three sinusoidal signals, uh, which are the voltages that we want to generate at the output. And uh, as mentioned in the video, we compare them with uh, a triangular waveform, a carrier waveform. Uh, and we set that to whatever switching frequency we want, which is right now 10 kilohertz. And um, if your duty cycle is greater than the triangle value, you turn on the top switch of that particular phase. And if the duty cycle is lesser than the triangle's value, we turn on the we turn off the top switch and we turn on the bottom switch. So what this basically does is it uh, for any particular voltage, uh, the power electronic unit generates an average output voltage at every uh, switching time period. So it keeps the switch on for some time and off for some time. But the average of those two levels would be equal to whatever duty cycle, whatever voltage value you want at any particular instant of time. So that's pretty much all uh, is to assign period. You have three sine waves phase shifted by 120 degree of certain magnitude that you desire. And you compare it with a triangle, generate the duty cycles, give it to the switch. And the switch is going to uh, generate the desire, uh, required output voltage. So first, let's look at the A, B phase voltage. So right now I'm uh, having it at maximum possible generation ratio. Uh, if you look at the A, B output phase voltage, uh, again, this does not look anything like a sinusoid, but uh, once we average the, once we filter out the switching frequency component, look at the fundamental, uh, you'll see it's uh, pretty much a sine wave. So let's uh, zoom in at uh, where you would expect the peak of the sine to be. So at this point, if you see it's uh, almost, uh, most, it's most of the time on, a little bit time off. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Uh, can you see the screen now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I I just realized that I wasn't sharing the screen. So what I did was I uh, just uh, ran the simulation of uh, sine PWM. So this is the model. Here we have a sine wave. Uh, we are comparing it with a triangle wave. And uh, that uh, generates which switch needs to be on or off, as I mentioned. And uh, we are giving that to a power processing unit. And in the simulation, I've represented a power processing unit as just a gain block. So that's exactly what a power processing unit does. It just converts uh, low voltage gate signals, which are on and off, uh, which could be anywhere between zero to 10 or 15 or 12. And it converts it to a high voltage DC signal using transistors or IGPPs or MOSFET. So that's, uh, so I'm just representing that the power processing unit by an average model by just multiplying by the DC bus voltage, which is 100 volts in this case. So let's go ahead, run the simulation. And uh, if you look at the line to line voltage, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this does not look anything like a sine wave, uh, but once you run it through a filter and remove the high frequency component, you can just see the fundamental, which will be a perfect sine wave. So uh, if you look at where the peak is expected to be, you can see that the uh, switch is on for most of the time. And the output voltage is 100 volts for most of the time. And there is an off period, which goes to zero at, for a small period of time. And if you look at where you would expect the zero crossing of a sign to be, you can see the switch is off for most of the time and it's on for very small instance of time. And as you keep going more and more towards 90 degree, the on time is gonna increase and the off time is gonna reduce. And what does the average uh, voltage, so before that, let's look at the phase voltage as well. So the line to line voltage has three levels, positive DC, zero and negative DC. The phase to phase voltage, because of the way the three phase system is connected, you would have one, two, three, four, five levels, which is two by three VDC, one by three VDC, zero, negative one by three VDC, and two by three VDC. So um, if you look at the peak of the voltage, so that would be two by three times VDC, which is worth six to six volts. And if you look at the other level, it would be one by three times VDC, which is about 33 volts. So this is the phase voltage that you get. Again, these the voltage levels are not part of the DC bus. It is just the way that the three phase system divides up uh, the available 100 volts into three, five distinct levels. So those are the two voltages. And uh, if you look at, so right now I said the duty is set to the maximum and the maximum assigned PWM can generate if you have 100 volts DC bus is 50 volts peak uh, phase voltage. So as you can see here, so what I'm doing is I took the phase voltage that we measured here and I'm just pushing it to a moving average to remove high frequency component. So this is what any uh, practical systems that uh, we would use would do. So if you take, um, let's say you connect it to a light bulb, 
uh, right? And you push this high frequency component, the inductance in the wire and then the perception or vision that you have that has a small filter in your eye too. That's why you can't see anything blinking faster than 30 Hertz. Or if you're older, it's about 22 Hertz and stuff like that. So they, all of practical real time or, or practical real world systems are some form of low pass filter. Uh, again, there are extreme cases where you can show high pass filter in real life as well. But most of the systems are uh, low pass filter. So again, a motor, because of the inertia of the rotor, it's a low pass filter. So it won't pre see these high frequency component. And an RL circuit is again a low pass filter. You can pass a high frequency voltage, uh, high frequency component will damp it out so that only the low frequency fundamental current flows, the high frequency component is extremely damped out. So that's what we are kind of emulating here by just putting a low pass filter, which is a moving average is one form of low pass filter. Uh, so if you look at the voltage after pushing it through the filter, this voltage, which had just on and off levels, we have removed out the, the high frequency 10, hertz, 10 kilohertz and higher multiples of it away. Um, and we just get this component. Again, you should note that when we are using a triangular wave instead of a sawtooth, uh, if you're switching frequencies 10 kilohertz, you won't have a 10, uh, you won't have a, a harmonic content at 10 kilohertz. You would have it at uh, even multiples. So you'd have it at 20 kilohertz, 40 kilohertz. So it's one advantage of using a triangle over a sawtooth in three phase uh, sine PWM or space vector PWM. And that's why we go to triangle. So at no additional cost, you get a reduction in uh, lower uh, harmonic content. So instead of 10, you'll get it at 20 kilohertz. The net harmonic content itself would not be reduced, it's just it pushes to higher uh, uh, frequency so that your total harmonic distortion, the way it's defined, uh, is reduced because it has more weight for lower frequency harmonic rather than high frequency. So the peak of this is limited to is uh, 50 volts. Uh, this is the upper limit you would get for a phase peak voltage when you assign period. And if you look at the line to line voltage, which was this one, and the average waveform of the line to line filter, again, after pushing it to a moving average, uh, you can see the peak goes to, uh, it should be 86.666, which is root, root, root three by two. So let's see if that's where it settles. Yep, it's exactly where it goes and settles. So again, uh, in real life, you wouldn't have these sharp peaks because I'm pushing it through a moving filter, which is again, a discrete filter. You have these uh, sharp corners here and there, but uh, in a real life system, which is a continuous system, like an RL load, it will be more smooth rather than uh, this kind of peaks. So this is just for a simulation. So if you look at this exact peak here, it'll be 86.6 something. So that's root three by two. So that'll be your uh, root three by two times uh, 100. So that'll be your maximum line to line voltage peak. So this is sine PWM, uh, quite simple. Now let's next go to SVPWM. So it gets a little bit more complicated, but the concept is uh, pretty much the same. Oh, and uh, before we, it's, uh, I forgot to mention one more thing. So if you look at the duty cycle of a sine PWM, it's perfectly sinusoidal. So you have a triangle which will compare with these three sine waves. So it just goes from uh, centered around 0 0.5, as those of you who have attended the power electronics uh, workshop would have seen the formula for all of this. Uh, one by two times desired uh, voltage by VDC plus uh, 0 0.5. So that's the value. It goes from zero to one, centered at 0 0.5, and it's perfectly sinusoidal, just the way you want the input voltage. Again, there is no requirement to it to be sinusoid. You can have any waveform. Uh, if you want an output to be sinusoid, you need your reference to be sinusoid. If you want it to be trapezoid, make it a trapezoid. It doesn't matter. But uh, for all motor controls, you would use sinusoid, AC motor controls. So SVPWM uh, is just, uh, so a sine PWM is, can be derived from SVPWM. So it's one small aspect of SVPWM would be sine PWM. And I'll give a brief explanation of how that is done. But uh, so in SVPWM, you have again, three sine wave voltages that you'd like to generate. And then according to the formula that professor had mentioned in the video, you take the maximum of this, minimum of this, uh, sum them up, uh, divide by half and subtract it from all of the duty cycles. So that would give you a duty waveform. So let's go ahead and run this and look at the duty waveform to get a better understanding of what's going on. So if you look at the duty waveform in sine PWM, it was all perfectly sinusoidal. Oh, if I run that, that'll go away. So it was all perfectly sinusoidal. In this case, uh, you would have uh, triple N harmonic content. Uh, let's not worry about what the term means, but uh, it's basically uh, just multiples of third harmonic. So if you have, if you want to generate a sine of 60 Hertz, then uh, you, the duty cycle that you generated uh, uh, would have components at uh, 180 Hertz. And then there won't be a component of even triple N, there'll only be odd triple N. So there'll be another at nine times 60. Uh, and then going on, it'll another one would come at 15 times 60, 12 would be skipped. 
so all odd triple and harmonic component would be summed up in certain ratio and uh, that's this waveform so if you put pass it through a um, a fourier transform and look at the harmonic spectrum you would be able to see uh, all those components so the reason uh, so the advantage of doing this kind of additional waveform change is if you look at the so uh, again notice that the duty cycle is this we a weird non sinusoidal waveform but the output voltage would be perfectly sinusoidal too so let's look at the line to line voltage again again it's the same thing goes from 0 to 100 or uh, 0 to minus 100 three voltage levels and you would have uh, most of the time on during uh, peak of the sign most of the time off during the zero crossing of the sign and if you look at what happens when you pass it through a low pass filter uh, you can see the line to line voltage uh, and let's uh, look at the peak of the line to line voltage before we talk about how so if you look at the peak of the line to line voltage it goes to close to 99 98.4 but uh, it's the value would be uh, exactly 100 uh the the step time we for practical simulation and limitation we could it at 1 minus 6 but if you uh, refine the step time even further make it much much smaller and increase the switching frequency you'll be able to see that this value theoretically reaches uh, the dc bus voltage the line to line voltage uh peak of the line to line voltage so this is the advantage that you get with uh, svpwm and uh, if you look at the phase voltage you would get the same amount of additional voltage uh, which is so as we will have as 15 percentage uh, more can generate 15 percent synthesize 15 percent more voltage than um, sin pwm so if you look at the peak voltage uh, sorry the non filter peak voltage it has the same level 2 by 3 times vdc 1 by 3 times vdc 0 vdc minus 1 by 3 times minus 2 by 3 times and if you look at the filter it has again three sinusoid voltages but a little bit higher voltage than as we will have or sin pwm because sin pwm had limit of 50 volts this one goes up to I think it should be around 58 if the math is right. Yep, around 58. So, but the thing to notice is uh, in sine pwm you had sinusoid duty, you got sinusoid output. But here you have non-sinusoid duty, but you'd still get sinusoid output. That is because these triple and components that you added are in same phase with one another. So even though your duty cycle and the power processing unit see these voltages, a three-phase load, uh, which is a balanced load, but, uh, definitely. Uh, which does not have a neutral return point would not see these triple n voltages because the three phase voltages uh, the currents caused due to them would cancel out each other because they're exactly in phase so they don't generate any net potential difference so if you have if you say if you have a phase voltage at uh, 80 volts and b phase voltage at 80 volts as well the ab winding does not see any voltage because both of them are the same potential so that's what you get by adding a triple n harmonic so at a phase you add sine of 3 times 60 degrees a uh, 60 hertz and you have uh, at b phase uh, sine of 3 times 60 hertz c phase also the same thing sine of 3 times 60 hertz but if it was fundamental it would have been sine of 60 hertz whatever it uh, in omega is uh, plus uh, plus 0 degrees and then for b phase it would have been uh, 2 pi into 60 plus uh, or minus 120 and then for c phase it would have been minus 240 but for triple n harmonic the way we added it will all be exactly in phase so the uh, three phase winding without a neutral and balance will never see the third harmonic component that allows you to do this kind of manipulation and this is only feasible with a uh, third harmonic addition so it could be third sixth or so 3 times 60 6 times 60 9 times 60 any of those uh, but within that there is quite an easy proof that you can show that only the odd triple n harmonics would produce the maximum uh, duty cycle if you had even uh, uh, triple n harmonics like 6 12 it will distort the waveform in such a way that you won't be able to achieve the maximum duty cycle again the proof uh, is quite easy and i won't uh, go into the details of it so this is just one form of implementing the min max method is one form of implementing sin pwm it's most widely used uh, form in industry because it does not require you to generate a third harmonic as such it is automatically computed by the min max method which is a simple math operator uh, but for understanding reasons uh, there is also another method which is uh, basically do physically injecting the third harmonic uh, so which is this so you take a three phase sine wave uh, which is a 50 hertz for this example and you add a third harmonic which is 1/6 the value at 150 hertz and if you look at the results the output voltage would still be the same the peak of this should go to 100 yep it does and the peak of this should go to about 58 and yep it does so the output voltage waveforms averaged output voltage waveform for this method also looks the same but if you look at the duty it's a little bit different 
So let's go and do the other one again. So if you look at this duty, there was like more of a, a discontinuous turn at this point. If you see, if you do the DVDT here, you would get infinity because it was a sudden discontinuity at that point. Uh, but if you look at uh, the other one with third harmonic injection, you're just uh, adding a continuous signal to another continuous signal. So you, the result would also be a continuous signal. Yeah, so if you look at this, there is no form of discontinuity here. So this is just another way of generating a duty cycle. Again, this uses, uh, so this also again uh, adds only, this adds only the third harmonic component. Uh, the waveform, when we did the other minimax method, if you resolve it using Fourier, that would add third, ninth, 15th, 21. So a whole bunch of third harmonic or triple and harmonic at certain ratios to get that particular waveform. But both of it uh, generate the desired voltage, same uh, waveform and everything averaged. Uh, there are certain advantages. So if you look at uh, papers on IEEE, there'd probably be like a thousand different papers, thousand different methods, all of them under the title SPPWM. All of them just tinker around with different ratios of these harmonic content, uh, each of them offering certain advantage. Uh, so if you push the harmonic content towards higher frequencies, uh, the total harmonic distortion is the way it's calculated, which gives more weight to lower values rather than higher, uh, it would be reduced. Uh, so there are certain advantages there. Certain would require you to have it at lower values. Uh, so, so depending on what you're doing, uh, because at lower values, it would mean lesser amount of uh, switching transitions compared to at higher values. So there are certain advantages that you get disadvantages with each method. So these are the two common methods and there are a lot of other methods too, but all of them come under the same title of SVPWM. So to go from SVPWM to sine PWM uh, is quite easy, the theory part of it. So SVPWM, you had a outer hexagon uh, of you by the six space vectors and you inscribed an inner circle uh, within which your space vector has to lie. If you have three sine waves, do the space vector transformation, it'll be, with, it'll be a circle. Uh, and within that circle, you put inscribe another hexagon and within that hexagon inscribe a circle that would be a sine PWM. So sine PWM is just a subdivision of uh, SVPWM. It can be extended just from SVPWM from the graphical uh, element of it. So with that, I will stop the simulation on SVPWM and sine PWM. And if you, anybody has any questions, uh, let me know and uh, I can get to that. So uh, the next topic that we will be diving into is um, direct or control. Um, and uh, once we are done with it, we'll again look at a simulation of uh, this method. So this is a very, uh, this is a different method of achieving the same results as uh, vector control. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, overview where we see So in this chapter, we will look at direct torque control called DTC, an encoderless operation of induction machines. So here is the overview where we see that this induction machine is being supplied by this uh, inverter. And uh, in doing so, we are measuring the currents and only two of the currents need to be measured because uh, third one we can obtain by Kirchhoff's current law. And then uh, we, all, we also need the information about the voltages, and that is provided by the switching signals for these uh, three uh, bipositional switches here. And that, uh, all this information goes into an estimator. And here you can see uh, listed here that we have measured inputs, stereo voltages, and stereo currents, and estimated output then is uh, torque and mechanical speed, and that's what makes it encoderless, and stereo flux amplitude and its angle. <clears throat> so the bottom line is that in uh, DTC, our intent is to keep the amplitude of the stereo flux within a certain band and then directly provide the torque that uh, this machine needs based on some outer loops like uh, controlling the speed as is the case in this uh, overview here. <clears throat> so you can, you know, we can go a little bit uh, further into it. We can see that we have a reference mechanical speed, then this estimated mechanical speed here. Uh, and the difference of these two uh, goes into uh, this PI controller uh, 
which gives the torque reference indicated by this asterisk sign. And then that is uh, uh, compared uh, with the, the estimated electromagnetic torque that this machine is providing. And the difference of the two goes into this block. And we'll talk about that in a second. And similarly, this estimated speed that is uh, coming out of this estimator goes into the amplitude of the uh, stator uh, reference uh, flux. Uh, you know, so it takes into account this uh, you know, flux weakening region in extended uh, range of uh, speed. And so that amplitude uh, is compared with this estimated uh, amplitude over here and the difference of the two uh, as the input goes into the selection of which uh, <clears throat> stator voltage vector we should apply to this machine here. So that's basically uh, an overview of this uh, uh, DTC control. So how does this work? What is the principle behind it? Well, the principle is very simple, uh, and that is based on this equation for electromagnetic torque that we can derive. And that is derived in detail in, in the book. And as you can see here, it depends upon, uh, these are all machine quantities over here, but uh, this is the peak amplitude of the stereo flux, the rotor flux linkage. When I say flux, I really should be saying flux linkage. And a sign of this angle between the stator and the rotor flux linkage, theta sub SR, which is this over here. And all these uh, <coughs> um, uh, vector flux vectors and uh, the angles are defined over here. And as you can see that uh, this is the stator A axis, this is the rotor A axis here. And, uh, <coughs> and uh, so from, uh, with respect to uh, stationary stair A axis, this is uh, theta sub M as the rotor rotates, uh, this is changing. And then uh, this is the position shown of the rotor uh, flux linkage, lambda sub R. And the point here to make is that uh, rotor is really a short circuited cage with a very small uh, resistance of the rotor bars. So uh, this uh, flux linkage, uh, because of the theorem of constant flux linkage, this flux linkage cannot change in a very short time delta T here. So that's why it's showing here that uh, the rotor flux linkage at time T is pretty much equal to what it was, uh, you know, one uh, sampling time before. And then, <clears throat> and the angle uh, of this rotor flux linkage uh, vector is shown with respect to, you know, stair A axis as theta sub R, and with respect to rotor A axis as theta sub R with subscript, superscript A. And then we have <clears throat> the, the stator flux linkage vector uh, at this time. Uh, and uh, this is what we are trying to change in order to control this torque over here. Because as you can see here, it's uh, very sensitive to the angle between the stator and the rotor flux linkage uh, space vector. So we, this should be a dot over here. We are, multiply, we are applying this uh, voltage space vector Vs uh, arrow uh, times uh, this delta T. For this particular time, we are applying it. In a, and we, we try to apply it uh, perpendicularly here, let's say. And uh, so it is going to change the position of the stereo flux linkage uh, space vector, but uh, not the amplitude very much because these two vectors uh, are this one and this one are perpendicular to each other as much as possible. <clears throat> okay, so that's uh, basically uh, the the idea of this direct torque control uh, in an induction machine here. So, so let's go through the the basic equations that uh, this is based on. And again, these are derived in great detail uh, in, in the book and. Uh, uh, we, we shouldn't really be going through them. So this is the, the equation for the, the stator in terms of the stator's uh, voltage space vector, the current, and the flux linkage, right? So we can write it uh, in this form here, where this is at time t is equal to at, at, uh, at previous time step, and uh, then the integral of uh, this quantity here from 
the previous time to the present time over here. So this is a <clears throat> vector, so it has an amplitude and it has an angle theta sub s over here. So that's uh, the equation for stator flux linkage uh, space vector. And we can also then calculate the rotor flux, which depends upon this uh, stator flux space vector, which we have just uh, <coughs> computed, and also the, the stator current space vector, which uh, uh, we can get by measuring the stator currents as shown in the previous diagram here. And again, this being a uh, vector, it has an amplitude and it has an angle this theta sub r. And, uh, and as you recall, the definition of theta sub r uh, with respect to uh, stator A axis. <clears throat> and, uh, and then we can, uh, we can write the equation for, the, for estimating torque, which uh, turns out to be of this form over here. So as you can see, this is the imaginary part of uh, lambda sub s uh, conjugate and i sub s over here, okay? So that allows us to compute the electromagnetic torque without having to actually measure it, which will be very expensive to do. And so now the next thing is we have, to, we wanna make it encoderless. So we have to uh, estimate the mechanical speed. So as you can see here that uh, omega sub r is really the time rate of change of theta sub r and theta sub r is, uh, uh, you know, in a an interval, this interval over here, which we have to judiciously, judiciously pick, it's equal to uh, theta sub r at time t minus theta sub r at the previous time over here, divided by that uh, time interval over here. <clears throat> so that's theta sub r, and this omega slip is the rotation of uh, uh, you know the uh, rotor flux linkage space vector uh, with respect to the rotor a axis okay and that is given by this expression over here again all these things are, are derived in the book so i will not belabor that point here so what is omega sub m is really omega sub r minus omega slip over here so that's omega sub m and that is uh, the the speed at which the rotor is rotating and uh, mechanical speed, but in radians, electrical radians per second, all right? Electrical radians per second. And then mechanical speed and actual mechanical radians per second is sort of obtained by multiplying omega sub m by two over the number of poles that we have. Okay. So we have all the equations that we need. So now we have to decide uh, in order to control this electromagnetic torque, what uh, uh, voltage space vector we should apply. <clears throat> so we know that uh, from an inverter, we can only get uh, six active uh, vectors shown here, V1, V2, so on like that. And then we have two uh, zero uh, voltage vectors, you know, where all the switches are either in the up position in all three poles are there in the down position here. And we divide them into uh, six sectors as shown here. So between this line and this line here, we have sector one and we can similarly show uh, the other sectors. So, so here we should uh, think about what uh, voltage uh, space vector we should apply depending upon what we need to do with uh, torque and with uh, uh, stator flux uh, amplitude. So the bottom line is that we would like to maintain the torque in a band here. So let's say this is torque, electromagnetic torque. Similarly, we like to maintain this lambda sub s amplitude within a band over here. Okay. <clears throat> so depending upon what is needed, we will apply the uh, appropriate uh, voltage space vector. So let's say that we are in sector one and let's assume that uh, you know this voltage is uh, uh, let's see here this lambda sub s right now let's just uh, take it as uh, in between here but it could be argued for any other position of lambda sub s in uh, within this sector one but the bottom line is that we are describing it for sector one and this can then be applied to other sectors and and within a sector different positions of this uh, 
stator flux linkage uh, space vector. So let's say given this position here that we are assuming, uh, you know, these are the six possible uh, active voltage vectors we can apply for this uh, particular uh, time step that we judiciously choose. So, so you can see here that uh, applying any of these uh, voltage space vector for some particular uh, time interval delta t would have certain impact. And that is uh, that we can see here, that if we apply V1, it's not going to change the angle of the stator flux linkage space vector, but it's going to increase the amplitude. Whereas if we apply V3, well, it's going to change, it'll go increase the angle uh, in a counterclockwise direction, and will also change the amplitude of lambda sub s. Whereas if you apply V2, then you'll see that it uh, again changes the angle in the counterclockwise direction, but will decrease the amplitude of lambda sub s. Okay, so with that knowledge, we can very easily, actually I, I probably should have <coughs> talked about it with this slide, but uh, it's just, uh, you can see it more clearly here because all the information is here in the, in the single slide. So you can see selection of stator voltage space vector. And uh, if uh, you want to increase the electromagnetic torque and you want to also increase lambda sub s amplitude, you know, it makes the logical sense to apply V3 as I explained earlier. And if you want to increase uh, uh, this torque, but want to decrease this, then it makes sense to apply V2. Similarly, you can talk about the effect of V4 and V5. But you know, like I mentioned to you earlier, that we have other possibilities of applying uh, zero voltage vectors, especially if you are within this electromagnetic torque band and you're within this uh, flux uh, linkage amplitude, uh, did I say torque band? I meant to say hysteresis band. And similarly, if you are within this hysteresis band of lambda sub s amplitude and torque, uh, electromagnetic torque, uh, uh, hysteresis band, if you're within that, then maybe you wanna apply uh, zero voltage, okay? So that's uh, the effect of zero uh, stereo space vectors are shown here. You're not, you're not applying any voltage uh, for a certain interval delta t. So what's going to happen <clears throat> is that, uh, you know, this, uh, you're not applying uh, any chain in the stator uh, voltage, so this, uh, this, uh, this sign should really be equal to approximately equal to zero. So the change in the position of the stator flux linkage uh, vector would be essentially zero. So theta sub s would not change, okay. What is happening with theta sub r a? Uh, well, that uh, with respect to a axis, that is also not going to change very much. So this is also equal to zero, okay? So again, this uh, rectangular you see is approximately equal because as I mentioned earlier, rotor is a short circuited cage. So with respect to its own axis, capital A, uh, this rotor flux linkage is not going to change. So this is going to be essentially zero. And so theta sub, the change in the rotor flux linkage uh, space vector is uh, really uh, made up of these two changes. The, see the, the rotor is rotating. So this theta sub M would change. So rotor A axis was here uh, at previous time step and rotor A axis is over here. So there is a change in the, the, this mechanical angle, but this essentially is zero, this part over here. So you can see that uh, this again is approximately equal to uh, theta sub m because this part is essentially zero here, okay? And then you can see that uh, sine of theta sub sr is really the difference of these two over here. But you know, for small values of uh, angle in radians, uh, you can say the sine is the same as the, the angle itself here. So you can see that this is approximately the same. So this electromagnetic torque is uh, some coefficient k times, uh, and we had this equation in detail, 
but uh, if you assume that uh, amplitudes have not changed very much, then uh, <clears throat> this electromagnetic torque is uh, the difference of these two angles here. And uh, you can see here that since this is equal to zero, approximately, and theta sub r is equal to minus uh, delta, a change in theta sub r is uh, delta minus delta theta sub m from, uh, from this equation here, well, theta, change in theta sub r is this here, but there's a minus sign here. So that's why we get this equation here, okay? So you can see that there is a different, you know, this electromagnetic torque would change a little bit if we apply zero uh, stereo voltage space factor here. So that's what would make this electromagnetic torque move up and down and like this here. And we wanna make it within this band here, right? Uh, for electromagnetic torque here. So here is a, a Simulink block diagram, which uh, you know we should go through in detail. It's a fairly uh, complex uh, diagram, but uh, here it shows that uh, here is the, the you know the reference speed mega mechanical, and let's say you want to uh, keep this constant. So if that is the case this change here is equal to zero. You don't wanna make any change here. And there is a step change in load torque here. So we have done this in other uh, chapters as well. Well, there is a change in load torque as a step, but we wanna keep the mechanical speed constant. That means this change is uh, zero or, uh, you know, this, uh, you have this reference uh, mechanical speed here. And uh, so here, we can see that uh, uh, you know all this information that I mentioned to you earlier goes into this estimator block over here, and uh, from here we have uh, this mega. We estimate the, the mechanical speed, and that goes into the reference speed uh, compared with the reference speed, and using this PI controller, we compute the electromagnetic torque reference here, and uh, that is compared with the uh, uh, electromagnetic torque estimated in this block uh, over here, and uh, <clears throat> and same thing we do with the 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 rotor, uh, the flux linkage, lambda s, uh, which is the reference coming in here, and uh, then we also have the rotor flux linkage estimated here. And the difference of those, that these two here, uh, they, it go, all goes into the selection of the, the voltage uh, space factor <clears throat> to this machine model. So when I say actual, it's really not this not an actual machine, but it's the model of the actual machine here. So the results we see in this slide here, where we have this reference torque coming in and then the estimated torque over here, uh, they pretty much uh, have the same uh, waveform in both cases. And then we have the, the the reference speed is in red, which is you know constant. And then you have actual speed in in blue here, and this is the estimated speed over here. Okay, so they also look pretty much the same. And this is what's happening to the the stereo flux linkage uh, uh, vector amplitude over here. And you can see that uh, this red is the, uh, the estimated value and uh, a reference value, I should say, in red. This, and then estimated values in green here. So that's uh, within a tolerance band, you can see here. And you can see that uh, both rotor and stereo flux linkage uh, space vectors they are pretty much, uh, <clears throat> the amplitude is constant and uh, maybe a slight uh, jitter because of the, the, the thickness of the hysteresis band. And uh, here the position is plotted in uh, XY coordinates, alpha and beta coordinates here. So this is basically it. And uh, this is a quite common way to control uh, induction machines. Uh, if you use this approach, uh, <clears throat> One of the drawbacks, as one may say, is that 
the switching frequency of the inverter is uh, not constant. But there are other ways to get around that as well. So bottom line is that whether you use, uh, you know, vector control as we have seen earlier, or you use DTC, we ought to be able to control uh, this machine uh, in terms of its position, then its speed, and uh, by controlling the electromagnetic torque that uh, this machine generates to uh, compensate for the load torque. So thank you very much. Okay, so David. So uh, in this uh, part of the presentation, we will look into a simulation of direct torque control. And uh, it's implemented the way that the uh, professor had uh, spoke, uh, mentioned in the video using hysteretic control. And uh, as he had uh, mentioned, there are other ways of doing it as well. Uh, you could use the same concepts and everything, but uh, convert it to um, a regular space vector based PWM control so that you have a constant uh, switching frequency rather than variable switching frequency. But we won't go into that segment of it because it's very similar to uh, induction motor vector control that we saw yesterday. So you just use the direct torque control equation and convert the current that you get uh, into voltage using an additional PI controller. And that voltage you would send it to your uh, SVPWM control unit to generate the switching uh, voltage. So um, since we have already seen how to implement those aspects, we'll just look at uh, implementing the hysteretic controller uh, to be able to do direct torque control. So if you look at the motor model, it's, uh, it doesn't matter. You could use ABC model, DQ model, your uh, rotor could be aligned to whichever you want, your, uh, your DQ could be aligned to your rotor flux, stator flux. So the motor model itself can be however you want it to be designed um, because it's just a model of the motor and the respect of which where you model your motor, all of them should produce the same results. Uh, if, you, if it doesn't, then that means there's something wrong with the equations that you have created rather than uh, the way the expression produces, that like, all of them would produce the same results irrespective of which frame you use. Uh, but when you do uh, direct or control, uh, you would align your DQ frame with your uh, state of flux axis as uh, Professor had mentioned in the video. And uh, similar to when you had um, your uh, direct uh, vector control, you estimated your uh, slip speed to be able to estimate the position of your uh, rotor flux. Uh, you need to do something similar here as well. You need to estimate uh, from your uh, currents and your voltage, you need to estimate the position of your state of flux as well as you need to estimate your torque. Uh, in our previous, in, when we did vector control, there was uh, no reason to estimate torque. Uh, we measured the current and uh, we were doing current control or uh, the inner current loop. Uh, but uh, if you are going to do a torque control, you could uh, do that to scale your current reference converted to torque and then use the estimated torque instead of um, the current to close the loop there. Uh, but in direct torque control, the requirement is you need to use the estimated torque to be able to uh, figure out which vector to apply. So the, the, in, in the estimator model is pretty much just the inverse in some sense of the actual motor model. Um, you, uh, here in the motor model, you apply voltage and the torque and it gives you the currents and the speed. And uh, in the estimator model, you take those currents and then determine uh, what the mechanical speed was, what the torque was, and then where the state of flux position is. Uh, and the state of flux value as well, the magnitude of it. So once you have all of these information in the estimator model, uh, solve them using uh, the equations that were mentioned in the video as well as they are given detailed in uh, Professor Mohan's Advanced Electric Drives textbook. Once you have those values, uh, you can convert them into the required torque uh, and the sort of vectors that needs to be selected. So before we convert them to require torque, uh, so we, in this curve, uh, simulation, we are going to be controlling the speed of the motor. So to convert from speed to torque, we do the same thing as we have done uh, in all of the simulations so far, uh, starting from day one till today. Uh, you just add a PI controller and tune the controller for a transfer function of one by SJ or one by SJ plus B. 
Uh, so you tune your PA values and uh, none of those change compared to other control methods. Those will remain the same. And the output of it would be the desired reference torque uh, the, that you need. And once you know the torque that you need and the estimator gives you the estimate of the actual torque that's in the motor, estimate of the torque that's in the motor, uh, you can determine the difference between uh, what is desired and what's actually present. So the, the and this the delta torque would be needed to determine which uh, switching state to apply. And similarly, the estimator model will give you an estimate of what the state reflux is, uh, and you can you know what the desired uh, state reflux needs to be. Uh, again, we are not looking into field weakening at this point. Uh, not we won't be talking about it in this uh, video either. Uh, so uh, this flux value we are going to keep constant, which is you know. Uh, affect the magnetizing current, which is linked to this uh, magnet flux. So the state of flux, we are not going to change. So we know what the desired value is, but, and we can estimate what the actual value is. And the differential flux would again be needed to control which space vector that you select. And depending on the position uh, of your uh, flux space vector, which uh, sector it is in, again, the switch state is going to be determined by that too. So these three parameters go into this module. And then it determines which which of these switch uh, switching vectors that we saw the six uh, active vectors and one zero vector or uh, two zero vectors. So which of these eight vectors need to be selected would be determined by uh, the delta torque, uh, the difference in the torque between required and estimate, the difference in the state reflux between the required and the estimate, and which sector your state reflux is at right now. Depending on that, you would pick uh, three vectors. Uh, uh, what was it? Um, and then apply those vectors in sequence one after another. And pretty much uh, that would generate your uh, output voltage uh, once you feed those switching vector to your inverter, that will generate your on off voltages. And uh, that voltage would then go to your motor and then it would generate the currents and then the whole loop closes itself again. So for this uh, example, we would be running uh, on the actual motor that we have in our lab, which is, as I mentioned, less than a 100 watt motor, really small motor. And uh, because uh, it's a really small motor, uh, it's inertia value and uh, it's uh, the time constant is quite small compared to what you would get with an industrial scale motor. So the effect of uh, those small time constant you would see when you run uh, direct torque control. And when you're running direct torque control for really small motor, that might not be the best uh, control strategy to use unless you can get really high switching frequencies. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this model. So we are get the data. So we are stepping the speed. Um, initially, it's at 152 radians per second, and at uh, time one second, we are stepping it to 100 radians per second. And the load torque. So initially, the load torque is uh, 24 millinewton meter. Uh, and then at uh, step time of 0.1 seconds, uh, we are uh, making the load torque half its uh, initial value. So we are making a 12 millinewton meter. So this is a really small motor and that's why the torque is really, really small. Mm. So if you look at the speed, so initially you start off at uh, zero speed and then it goes, uh, it, it's, this is pretty much steady state. So if you look at the scale, uh, it's really zoomed in. So it's about uh, 152 radians per second. And then at uh, 0.1 millisecond, we step the load torque and it shot up all the way. And then uh, you can, because we reduce the load torque by half. So once you reduce the load torque, it, the motor is going to accelerate and uh, then your PA controller kicks in and then it starts to pull the energy out of the rotor so that it can slow down and settle back at desired speed again. So that's what you see here happen. And um, you can see the small amount of uh, ripple that's there in the steady state value. Uh, those are there because of two reasons. First, uh, we have kept the step time reasonably big enough so that we can run the simulation fast enough for this presentation. Or if you were to fine tune this further and further down, the simulation would slow down, but the results would be much a little bit better, not much better. So in an actual motor, the, the magnitude of the ripple would not be this much. And the other reason is because of hysteretic control, there's going to be more THT component. And uh, since this is a really small motor with a very small time constant, uh, there's going to be significantly more ripple than it would be in case of a bigger motor with a bigger time constant. So that's the pretty much the uh, hysteretic control of uh, the direct all control of an induction motor. And uh, one of the disadvantage you have, you would get with this way of implementing, again, there is an alternate way of implementing direct all control where 
you can have constant switching frequency as professor mentioned but the right now we have implemented using hysteretic control as you can see here uh, right so we use uh, these hysteretic bands to determine which uh, vector to apply so you have the hysteretic band within which you don't change the vector and outside which you change the vectors for the torque and similarly you have an hysteretic band for the flux so because of the hysteretic way of controlling it you can see the current uh, in all our previous experiments uh, when we ran uh, induction motor vector control and stuff on this particular motor the currents were much much cleaner uh, so we could actually open that and run it just so that we make sure that the results are what we claim to be so let's let's get the control model so let's look at the current of vector control and see if it's actually sinusoidal so and we have before we do the look at the motor parameters so these are ex exactly the same motor parameters of the one that uh, we are using for direct torque control uh, in vector control if you see the uh, currents you can see that they are pretty much sinusoid like your eye cannot uh, differentiate uh, the small harmonic component that's present so it's really really sinusoid when you use the uh, uh, vector control uh, but when you go to direct torque control let me run that model again to load the results so when you look at the direct torque control results you can see the current has a lot of uh, ripple content on it it follows an overall sinusoidal profile but there is significant ripple content so this current ripple is what caused the ripple in the speed so some of this ripple current again is due to small step time big step time we have used to solve may uh, accelerate the solving uh, that's some probably account for like 10 to 15 percent of this ripple but uh, the remaining majority of the ripple uh, is because of using a hysteretic band rather than a fixed of uh, control switching frequency and uh, this is again this level of thd is because of the low time constant of the motor in consideration if you were to do the same simulation in the megawatt level generator that we did in matlab and we also looked at in the previous uh, simulation for dfig uh, then this ripple would be much much lower because that has a bigger time constant uh, so with that uh, i'll end this uh, simulation and we'll go back to the last video for this uh, session which would be on um, this uh, which would be on permanent magnet uh, vector control so uh, once we are done with uh, vector control, looking at the video which should be about 15 minutes 10 minutes uh, we will look at uh, doing a simulation of the same uh, and looking at the hardware implementation as well uh, we won't run the hardware but we'll look at the hardware model a control model because there's a little bit of uh, concept that goes into uh, permanent magnet hardware implementation as opposed to induction motor so we'll go at that point as well and we should be done quite early around 11 15 11 30 after which we'll take a lunch break and then come back at 1 30 uh, to get a summary of all three days what we learned from professor mohan all right so let's go ahead and start this uh, video we will look at vector control of permanent magnet so in this chapter we will look at vector control of permanent magnet synchronous motor drives sometimes also called pmac drives so in this uh, looking at the cross sectional view and just a two pole machine we see a north and south pole on the rotor and then three phase winding on the stator and uh, this uh, this pole pair is producing a sinusoidal flux density distribution that is reaching the stator windings and that is represented by this uh, space vector BR and uh, the D axis is always aligned uh, with this uh, BR space vector and Q axis of course is at 90 degrees here. So we can see that uh, in the D axis of the stator winding we, the flux linkage is given by this equation expression ls which includes the magnetizing plus leakage uh, times isd and the field flux uh, from the rotor reaching the stator and uh, in the q axis there is no field flux so it's only this expression over here all right so we can write uh, in a very similar manner the d and q axis uh, uh, voltage equations and uh, we can then express uh, these two equations in in this form here in terms of uh, 
bringing DDT term to the left hand side. And then we notice that uh, from the previous two equations, we have lambda SD and lambda SQ, and we can substitute for lambda SD and lambda SQ, and uh, uh, then they will give us the, uh, you know, as this lambda terms can disappear from here. All right, so, so here we can see that, uh, uh, you know, the, the torque expression is very similar to that before, and we can uh, substitute that for uh, lambda SD ISQ and lambda SQ ISD, and uh, what we see here, the two other, two other terms cancel out, we are, we are only left with this here. <clears throat> and uh, D omega mechanical DT is given by this electromagnetic, uh, electromechanical equation, and uh, where omega m in radians per second is uh, p over two times the mechanical speed. Okay. So uh, it is kind of useful to have per, per phase a steady state equivalent circuit uh, where we see that uh, 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 this is what it looks like here, but we should uh, see the, the derivation of it and that we can see here that in steady state, DDT terms are zero. So VSD and VSQ are given by this expression. And if you multiply the second equation by J on both sides and add them together and then convert them into space vector form, then we have this expression here. There's a slight error here that this bracket should include J over here. So now from this, uh, space vector equation, we know how to go to the phasor equation, which is given like this here. And here we can see that the peak of this uh, uh, phasor, that's the voltage generated uh, in the stator A, A axis winding uh, due to the uh, rotation of the, the permanent magnets, is, uh, its peak is given by this expression, where this quantity uh, constant Ke is given by this, so it's uh, this peak is proportional to omega sub m. Okay. <clears throat> and then we can uh, go and uh, uh, simulate this uh, in this DQ reference frame, where these two quantities, reference quantities, may be coming from some outer controller. And if you look at the equation for VSD and VSQ, uh, you know only this part pertains to d-axis. And this is really the compensation term. You can think of it as a feed forward term. Similarly, in the Q axis, only this part is for Q axis. And you can think of this as a compensation term. And we have our feed forward term. And we have seen that before. So based on this equation and this equation, we you know, derive the, the PI controller coefficient KP and K sub I here. And uh, then we can see here in order to get the reference for d axis and q axis voltages uh, we add the compensation terms which are coming here uh, here and here and uh, adding those two here we get the uh, the reference uh, voltages for vsd and vsq and then this dq to abc transformation knowing theta sub m uh, then we can generate the the reference voltages for phases A, B, and C, and that is then the role of this PWM converter or inverter to give those voltages there, and then they supply the motor and these uh, currents IA, IB, and IC result. And by measuring the, the position, so we, here we really need a position sensor which tells us where the magnets are, and uh, so the, <clears throat> and then multiplying it by P over two, we get theta sub M, which gets fed back into this block here. And uh, also this uh, theta sub m is integrated, uh, is differentiated rather, d theta dt is a speed, we get omega sub m, which is needed uh, in these uh, compensation terms over here. All right, so, and we can see that uh, there's a limit to uh, these currents here. They, they should be less than, uh, the rated value which relates to the phase current rated value by this expression here. So I'm just trying to give an overview of what uh, uh, these things are and then we can then go 
and uh, model this in uh, Simulink, which is shown here. <clears throat> and then if there's a low torque disturbance, let's say low torque decreases as a step, then what happens to electromagnetic torque <clears throat> that is generated by the machine that is shown here and also to mechanical speed here. So then we move on to salient pole synchronous machines. So one thing to notice here is that uh, these are, uh, as described here, they are salient. That means not round ro rotor. And uh, so there's uh, a field winding here. Uh, you know, this and this is sh shown schematically like that. So there's a field winding which is supplied by DC current. And in addition, there's a damper winding. So, so damper winding is just like an induction machine. In the rotor, you have uh, you know, this squirrel, squirrel cage. The bars that are inserted parallel to the axis of the shaft, and these bars are short-circuited on both sides. So the same thing is done here. And the reason for this damper winding is to provide damping, as the name implies, under dynamic conditions. So when this machine is rotating at synchronous speed, where this D-axis is rotating at uh, the speed of the rotor in steady state, uh, you know there is no uh, volt, there is no voltage induced in these uh, damper bars, and therefore there's uh, there's really no role for these uh, damper winding or damper bars as such. But uh, during uh, dynamic oscillations, so there's the change in load torque, for example then uh, the speed doesn't remain constant. As we saw earlier, it goes through some variation. So during that time, uh, you know, these uh, bar car bar voltages in these bars would be induced and uh, currents would flow and cause losses. So that provides damping. So as the name implies, it's the damper uh, action that takes place. So here we see that on the D-axis, we have three windings. One is the field winding here. One is the damper uh, D-axis winding and the stator D-axis winding. But on the Q-axis, we have only two. The, the Q-axis rotor is damper winding and the Q-axis uh, stator winding here. So again, uh, we can do a very similar analysis as we have done before. I'm not going to the details here, but it's very similar. And uh, we come up with this equivalent circuit in D-axis and Q-axis which uh, satisfies, uh, uh, you know, each axis satisfy, uh, satisfies uh, all the equations related to that axis here. And you can see that VRD and VRQ are zero because uh, these are uh, for the damper windings, uh, winding and the uh, damper winding is short circuited at both ends here. So this is the electromagnetic torque that we can derive from equations that we have seen before. And you can see that there is a saliency term here because of the non, uh, because of the salient uh, pole machine, the saliency and the D-axis and Q-axis do not have the same inductances. LSD is not same as LSQ, so we get some uh, one term corresponding to the saliency. If it was a round rotor machine, then LSD would be equal to LSQ, and this term would be zero here. So. Again, similar to what we have done before, uh, we can draw a space vector and the corresponding space or phasor diagram. So this is uh, going to be the final um, simulation for uh, today. And um, after looking at the simulation, we will uh, take uh, to our lunch break and then come back uh, uh, for the afternoon session, which would probably last for about an hour. So let's go ahead and get started with our last simulation, which is going to be on uh, permanent magnet synchronous motor vector control. So for uh, uh, this uh, uh, model, we'll be only looking at uh, surface permanent magnet and not interior permanent magnet. So the difference between them is, as the name suggests, uh, uh, in a permanent magnet synchronous motor, uh, uh, the magnets at high power at least are usually on the rotor. 
um, and yeah, it's always on the rotor and then the state has the state of winding. Uh, and on to the rotor, uh, these neodymium magnets most likely are glued uh, to them. So if it's uh, glued onto the surface, they are called surface permanent, permanent magnet motor. And if uh, the rotor has uh, slots drilled into them and these magnets are uh, put inside them, uh, it's called an uh, interior permanent magnet motor. Uh, each has its own advantage and disadvantage. Uh, so if it's going to be a uh, motor rotating at really high speeds, and you have a permanent magnet motor, surface permanent magnet motor, which is glued on the rotor at very high speeds, uh, these uh, magnets start to experience uh, force, centrifugal force, pushing them outward. So they could rip the glue apart and kind of uh, come crashing and damage the whole motor. Um, so and it, so the interior permanent magnet is advantage in that respect, but uh, interior permanent magnet ends up being a little bit more expensive to manufacture compared to just surface permanent magnet where you just stick them with glue and call the day. Uh, so even in surface permanent magnet, when you go to really high speeds, there are way of getting around this centrifugal force acting outward, damaging the motor. So those of you who probably have worked with uh, quad copters where you've seen the BLDCs, uh, which have rotated really, really high speeds, uh, you would have seen that uh, they have a external rotor rather than an internal rotor, uh, and the magnets are on the external rotor. So what happens is when you rotate at really high speeds, the centrifugal force acting on the magnets would push them outward towards the frame of the external rotor so that it does not uh, go towards the air gap as it would in case of an internal rotor. So that kind of uh, does away with uh, the problem of the magnets, you know, tearing apart uh, in case of uh, high speeds. So an external rotor would actually help and kind of push into the glue and make it stick harder uh, due to the centrifugal force. So each has its own advantage, disadvantage, and um, uh, it, surfaces permanent magnet is cheaper to manufacture. IPM is more expensive. Uh, but one of the other advantage you get with IPM is uh, due to the LDLQ difference being present. Uh, so as you saw in the video, uh, when you have surface permanent magnet, LD and LQ are both the same. Uh, the axis, uh, inductance and the Q axis. But in uh, interior permanent magnet, there's going to be a difference. And you could use the difference to your advantage to uh, do away with uh, position sensor. And you can get really accurate position information. Uh, by injecting a high frequency component, uh, which we will not be uh, looking into any further. Uh, I just wanted to make a note of it so you have an idea of uh, the existence of two different motors. And uh, for today's uh, simulation, we will only be looking at the first one, which is surface permanent magnet, where LD and LQ components are one and the same. And that makes the simulation a little bit easy, the math a little bit easy, but other than that, um, not much of a difference. So let's uh, go to the model. Let's open it up. And um, so here is the permanent magnet uh, motor model. So the DQ model is exactly the same as what you would get with an induction motor. The only difference being that uh, in the induction motor in uh, doubly fed, you had to solve for the rotor flux equations as well and the rotor current equations. Uh, in single fed uh, squirrel cage induction motor, where uh, you align, uh, in case of vector control, where you align your d-axis with respect to your rotor flux, you only had to solve for your d-axis rotor flux, not your q-axis, because I was zero. So that reduced one equation. Uh, DFIG was four equations uh, compared to ABC model, which would have been six. DQ model of DFIG was four equations. DQ model of squirrel cage with rotor aligned with rotor flux would be three equations. And in case of uh, permanent magnet, your rotor is going to be a magnet. So there are going to be no currents, no induced voltage, none of those. Uh, unless you add those damper bars that Professor had mentioned, then it's a different case, which we are not going to consider here. Uh, but otherwise, there is going to be no induced current, nothing. So the uh, rotor flux is a fixed component. So that reduces two equations. There is no equation that needs to be solved to get the rotor D-axis flux or Q-axis flux. So it's just going to be a constant. And the one thing we do in vector control uh, for permanent magnet is we align um, it with respect to your rotor flux axis, magnetic flux axis, uh, similar to what you would do with uh, vector control of an induction motor. But uh, here is the advantage, here's the way point where it gets extremely simple with permanent magnet. Uh, in an induction um, uh, motor, even though you know your rotor position precisely using a speed encoder, speed sensor, you cannot uh, know the rotor flux position precisely uh, unless you have a very precise estimator model. You need to estimate it because uh, the rotor does not rotate at synchronous speed. It rotates as a speed lower than in motoring mode in the single 
uh, squirrel cage induction motor to reach flow speed. So you need to estimate where the flux is uh, based on your uh, state recurrence and uh, uh, measuring those components. Uh, in case of permanent magnet motor, uh, it's, it's called synchronous motor because the speed is synchronous speed at uh, steady state. Uh, it'll be dictated solely by the frequency of the input voltage. And as long as your voltage can supply the current required to produce the torque, load torque required, it will always rotate at synchronous speed. And uh, if uh, your voltage is not sufficient enough to generate the torque required, generate the current required to generate the torque needed to maintain the load, then the motor would immediately stop. Like it will go out of synchronization, come to zero, and this huge short circuit current would uh, flow through the motor. And that could uh, damage the motor winding, or uh, even worse, it could uh, equally worse, it could demagnetize the motor, which would make it useless. So, the permanent magnet motor, uh, you would align your rotor with uh, your DQ axis with respect to your rotor flux. And your rotor flux is basically along the uh, magnet uh, position, the radial axis of your magnet. And that is position is going to be always synchronously rotating. So you slap a current sensor on uh, your position uh, sensor onto your encoder onto your rotor uh, shaft, and you should be able to measure it quite accurately uh, without any problem. So you don't need any estimator model or anything. Um, you could again go to sensorless, have no sensor at all, reduce cost, and use an estimator model to get the position. But if you do have a sensor, just the sensor position is sufficient to get the uh, rotor flux position. So uh, we align the D-axis with respect to your rotor flux. So that means you only have D-axis component here. You can make your Q-axis flux to be zero because it's uh, not aligned along that direction. And uh, rest all the model, everything is same. You have the same DQ equations. You solve the same thing. Uh, you give three ABC voltages. And in this model, again, as I mentioned before, you could give your motor model voltage and speed. It will solve current and torque, or uh, voltage and torque. It will solve current and speed. Just the equations flip around a little bit to do either. Um, so here, in this case, we are giving the voltage and the load torque. And the motor, would, the motor model will determine what the actual currents would be flowing through the motor and what the actual speed profile of the motor is going to be. So similar to before, we are going to be controlling the uh, stator uh, D-axis current, uh, which in turn controls the stator D-axis flux. And then you'll control the stator Q-axis current, which controls in turn the stator other, which controls the rotor torque, the electromagnetic torque generated by the motor, I'm sorry. So, uh, and you extend that uh, Q-axis loop where by adding one more PI loop and you can control your speed. And uh, as I mentioned before, you could add one more PI loop and you should be able to control your position. Uh, so if you're doing position control, as I mentioned again earlier, uh, just a reminder, you don't need a PI controller, you just need a peak controller uh, because your integral of omega is theta, uh, unlike uh, speed to torque conversion where it's not just one by SJ in reality, it's one by SJ plus B. So even in your reference speed or your feedback speed matches your reference speed, you need some residual torque to sustain the viscous friction. Uh, so even if you have only inertia model and no load, you still have to supply the inertia of a viscous friction. So you need some residual torque. Uh, but that's not the case with position. Once you attain your desired position, you don't need any speed. In fact, if you apply any speed, it's going to make it uh, go wrong. The speed is going to change. Position is going to change. So you just need a P controller when you're doing a position control. Of course, this is again assuming all linear, non ignoring all non-linear effect like backlash and stuff, which are uh, which is a whole other discussion which we will not be doing today. So that's uh, pretty much it. Let's go ahead and run the simulation and see. So right now, let's uh, see what are the parameters at which we're running. So this permanent magnet motor is again really small a permanent magnet motor that we use in the lab. Uh, you could uh, check out uh, the motor here on the Cyamble website that I mentioned yesterday in the lab experiments. So even if you don't have the hardware, you could build, still do the simulation and the lab experiment talks about the simulation as well. And uh, you can download the software free, it'll always be free. You can use it uh, for learning purposes without any restriction. So it gives you step-by-step -step procedures to how to build a permanent magnet synchronous motor vector control in simulation. And then finally you have the hardware as well. But uh, if you're interested only in the simulation, you could do just the simulation alone. Uh, I think I should have an image somewhere uh, here. So it should be in the basic drives um okay so this is the permanent magnet motor that we are using 
So the power level of this permanent magnet motor is uh, higher than this DC motor. It's a three phase, so you can pack in more power compared to this. Uh, and uh, this uses, uh, this is a surface permanent magnet motor. Uh, and this is, I think, rated for about uh, 200 watts, if I'm not wrong. And as you can see, the induction motor that we saw yesterday, uh, you can see the size difference here for comparison. Uh, so this is the induction motor and the DC generator is the same, so you can get a size reference. The induction motor is almost two times the volume of the permanent magnet motor and the uh, power capability is almost one fourth that of the permanent magnet motor that we saw. Uh, so for the same power level, a uh, permanent magnet motor as the power level becomes higher and higher, uh, the power density of a permanent magnet becomes higher and higher as well. So uh, usually at a uh, megawatt level, you could find permanent magnet motor, which could be like one fifth or one fourth, one seventh the size of an induction motor for the same power level. Uh, you are able to do this because the permanent magnet motor has uh, uh, high density uh, uh, magnets on the rotor. Uh, so it reduces the volume, but in case of induction motor, you need uh, squirrel cages, uh, metallic structures, uh, which then induce currents and then form, it's an electromagnet in that sense. So it requires a bigger uh, size and it has lower uh, power density. So that's the reason induction motors are much, much bigger in size compared to permanent magnet motor. Uh, but uh, they are much cheaper, much rugged compared to permanent magnet. Permanent magnet uh, are expensive because of the magnets. Uh, it's a single source uh, supply uh, in China and it's quite limited. And the other thing is it's very brittle. So if you need rugged operation and uh, you know it has a lot of vibration being experienced then permanent magnet would not be the ideal solution. So that is, uh, this is the structure of the hardware, uh, the motor that uh, we are simulating. Uh, this is the parameters obtained using parameter estimation, similar to what we did for induction motor. You could do all the same tests for the permanent magnet as well and get its parameter. And uh, once you know the parameters, you should be able to uh, plug in the values for the KPKI controller design, which we saw on the first day of this uh, workshop. And you should be able to run the system. So once we uh, have done that, so right now what we are doing is we have a constant uh, uh, speed. So we are, this, this model, we are assuming that the motor is already run at steady state and it's settled down and we have initialized the simulation model to that value. Of course, in reality, the motor will always start at zero speed unless you speed it up with an external drive uh, prime over. But uh, in this case, we have already assumed that the motor has settled down at certain speed and we are starting the simulation from that point just so that we don't want to spend time in the initial transients knowing what happens. So to be able to do that, what we, how we go about doing that is in the parameters. We pre-calculate all the motor values by solving the motor equation, what the currents should be and what the speed should be, what the position should be. And within the integral block of all of these, we initialize them to uh, the pre-calculated values so that the simulation model begins as if it is already run and it's solved everything and it's starting from that point. So that's how you do it. Again, once you download this model and you can read through some of the procedures, it'll explain a little bit better. You should be able to get a better hang of it. So once we run that, and uh, in this model, we step the load from, uh, let's see. So initially the value was about uh, 100 Newton, millinewton meter, and we step it down by half, 50 millinewton meter. So the speed should ramp up and settle down. The controller should take over and bring the speed back to required speed. So as you can see, uh, the rated, so this is not even the rated torque of this motor. Uh, the, the rated torque is, I think, two or three times more than this value. And when you saw the induction motor exp experiments, we were having it around the rated torque of around 20 millinewton meter. So this is around 200 millinewton meter. So it's significantly higher power level. Uh, and the speed are pretty much similar to in both of the cases. So the power level is much higher for much smaller size. So let's go ahead and look at the speed. As you can see, the speed was uh, at some desired value, which was 93 or 94, yeah, 94. And then it shoots a little bit uh, up once we uh, load the motor, once we reduce load of the motor, uh, it accelerates a little bit. So because it essentially goes into regeneration mode at this point where the controller then uh, sucks power out of the rotor shaft, uh, energy from the rotor shaft and pushes the power back into the input so that the speed can be pulled down and then it settles down at uh, steady state speed. So this is, and it should be noted that all through this uh, experiment, uh, when you do vector control aligned with the rotor flux, you're always having your rotor flux and the stator flux at 90 degrees. Uh, in an induction motor, uh, that happens because of the uh, equations uh, or magnetic equations. 
because of the induced voltage and the induced current, it's going to be at 90 degrees. Uh, but in a permanent magnet, that needn't be the case. Uh, you always maintain at 90 degrees because you get that's the point at which you get uh, maximum power for the minimum amount of current, a maximum torque for the minimum amount of current. Uh, so because the formula for torque is all a product of your uh, rotor flux uh, times your uh, stator flux times your uh, angle between the two. So sine of a sine of the angle between the two. So if it's at 90 degree, that becomes the maximum point. So you could have minimum amount of stator flux or a stator current, uh, which would cause the maximum amount of torque uh, for 90 degree. Uh, and once the angle starts reducing, you would start losing. You would have to inject more amount of current to generate the same amount of torque. So that's the reason we always maintain a 90 degree, but that's not a requirement. You could maintain it lower too, but it's preferable to do that. And um, so that's your speed. And if you look at the, what was the other thing that I wanted to show? The current, the current waveform. So let's just look at the DQ currents. As you can see, the currents are pretty smooth and nice. It's going to be DC quantities because we're in DQ. And uh, that is uh, pretty much uh, the simulation for induction of the permanent magnet vector control. And the last thing is uh, we kept the flux. Uh, you can adjust the flux. Even though you have a permanent magnet on the rotor, uh, you can adjust the flux in the air gap, uh, which in turn would affect the torque and which in turn would indirectly affect the speed as we'll see later. Uh, is that you can adjust the flux and weaken the flux so that uh, you do not want to increase the flux because usually you put the magnet uh, to its maximum capacity so that it doesn't any further addition would end up saturating most likely. So you wouldn't want to do that. Uh, you could weaken the flux by injecting currents in the D axis of the stator so that it opposes the flux in the air gap uh, created by your rotor magnets. So that would reduce the flux in the air gap. And the advantage that you get uh, because of this is there is a limit on the voltage that's available for you. Because if you, usually if you have a drive, industrial drive, uh, it's at around uh, standard 600 volts or 800 or 1000 volts. Uh, 1000 pretty high, but around 600, 800. So the, at these voltages, um, the DC bus voltage is gonna be fixed. And that again is gonna be derived from your grid voltage using uh, just the diode bridge rectifier or at high powers or at lower powers, people actually use active back-to-back -back converters. So the DC bus voltage is gonna be fixed. So the amount of voltage that you can generate in the output, the maximum value is gonna be fixed. So that is gonna limit uh, the maximum frequency to which you can go. Uh, so if you weaken your uh, field, which in turn would reduce the maximum torque you can achieve if you can sacrifice on the maximum torque, it will allow you to go to speeds higher than what you can with just the rated flux. So that's when you would do field weakening and uh, it's pretty much done in every drive that's available in the market. Um, the One of the obvious question would be why not just increase the voltage, uh, design the drive better or you know, design the motor such that uh, it can reach high frequency so that the flux is of appropriate value so that you don't need field weakening. Uh, the problem is someone, so the, the supplier of the drive and the supplier of the motor might not be always the same uh, and they not the coordination between the two. So you deal with whatever drive you have and whatever motor you have. And if you need to push to higher speeds, you just do field weakening to get around the limitation rather than having to work around with designing a new motor and stuff. So uh, that uh, pretty much uh, completes our discussion on uh, permanent magnet vector control uh, as well. And um, so with that, uh, let's uh, stop this. So, so since we have a little bit more time around 30 minutes, let's utilize some 10 to 15 minutes of it. Um, oh yeah, there's one more thing that I forgot to mention. So when we go to real time control, um, you need to, there is a little bit of difference in the way you implement real time control for induction motor as opposed to permanent magnet synchronous motor. So in an induction motor, if you look at the rotor, um, if you ignore the fact that uh, the rotor bars are gonna be slanted a little bit to avoid clogging, uh, let's assume it's all parallel and uh, uh, perpendicular to the uh, ground. In that case, if you dissect the uh, induction motor radially, the uh, induction motor rotor radially along any direct, any angle, it's always going to be symmetrical. It is just a set of series of rotor bars and you can dissect it along, along any bar uh, for, for radially and you would always see it's symmetrical. So that means when you start your motor, you don't have to worry about uh, where your magnetic axis of your rotor is because it's going to be induced voltage 
it does not matter which if you stopped your rotor at 30 degree yesterday or 20 degree yesterday 10 degree yesterday it doesn't matter it's all the same because it's extremely it's perfectly symmetrical uh, at least theoretically uh, so you don't have to worry about where the rotor position is when you start your motor uh, so you can just start, start applying your fluxes and then use your estimator model uh, to compute as if the position of the rotor was zero all along um the induced voltage would uh, do the rest of the job but in case of permanent magnet motor it, the rotor is not symmetrical so it is symmetrical along the magnetic axis or perpendicular to the magnetic axis but if you were to radially cut the motor uh, rotor along any other angle it will not have the same symmetry uh, so because of the magnets present so there is a magnetic axis and a non magnetic axis which is perpendicular and everything else in between has certain uh, has uh, the flux magnetic flux along that axis would vary cosinusoidally so along zero degree of the magnetic axis it will have the full magnetic flux then cosine it will vary cosine of uh, whatever the angle is so at 90 degree it will be absolutely zero uh, electrical angle i mean so because of this non symmetry it is quite important to know where the rotor position is initially so when you start your motor because you align your dq axis with respect to rotor flux so if you if uh, my rotor flux was at uh, 30 degrees and i assume that the rotor is at 0 degrees and align my dq axis with 0 degree then i won't be doing proper vector control so I, in fact i would end up having reduced torque because the angle between your d axis flux and your stator flux and the rotor flux would not be 90 degree which is desired for maximum torque for minimum current but rather 60 degree because it's 60 minus 30 the initial position so you would have to apply more current to generate the same amount of torque which would lead to more losses so and it can be viewed off as in some way of doing flux weakening because you're injecting a current in the opposite direction in the d axis as well which is leads to flux weakening weakening the flux so to avoid that you need to know the exact position of the rotor magnet uh, to do that there are multiple ways so the easiest and the obvious way would be to use a position encoder an absolute position encoder so the encoder that we have seen so far so uh, if you go to so the encoder that we use in all our labs uh here is uh, this encoder which is the uh, which is a, a a quad b encoder so it gives you a uh, number every time the rotor turns if it turns by say uh, 0.1 degrees it gives you one on pulse so every 0.1 degree it gives you a pulse so you count the number of pulses you can know how much position has been traversed differentiate the position you get the speed so that's how we determine the position and the speed so this does not tell you what the initial position of the rotor was so that's the limitation of this kind of encoder uh, but the advantage is these are extremely cheap so if you use something called an absolute encoder which has a digital processor which integrates and thus uh, uh, retains the initial position and stuff so if you use that kind of uh, integrated uh, you will be able to get the initial position of the rotor as well uh, and these are a little bit more expensive compared to incremental and you know a little bit like 2 3 4 times expensive compared to uh, in incremental encoders and uh, also they have a little bit of uh, digital uh, logic needs to be implemented to communicate with them in this case it's just an on off pulse uh, that you can count using a counter so it's pretty straight forward but in an absolute encoder you need some form of serial communication that you need to implement to read those values so that is one way of fixing it so it will give you the initial position of 30 degree so you can set your dq angle to dq frames angle to be 30 degree initially and then start your uh, whole vector control Uh, so that would be the expensive easy way of fixing it there are uh, the cheapest way of fixing it would be what we do in the lab here uh, which is you, you you know that your rotor is uh, you don't know where your rotor is say it's at some angle 30 40 50 it doesn't matter you initially excite your a phase uh, with say very low voltage like around 2 3 volts or something and you short the b and c phase and connect it to ground so you apply to 2 or 3 volts across your a phase and your b and c phase are shorted and connected to the ground and current flows to the a phase and returns back to b and c phase so what happens is you have essentially created a magnetic uh, field stator magnetic uh, field flux which is aligned along the a phase so if you have a magnet everybody has played with magnets uh, when you were kids if you have a magnet and you have another magnet on top of it at some angle and you take your hands off they would both snap together and align uh, so that's exactly what we are doing here we are just playing with magnets essentially so you apply some current in the a phase so that you uh, create a electromagnet aligned along the a phase and your rotor could be anywhere as soon as it sees that there is a magnet nearby it's going to align its own axis uh, with that axis so that uh, the 
uh, it comes to the lowest energy state. If it's at any other point, there would be some stored energy uh, and they always prefer lowest energy state, so they strap back on together. So your rotor magnetic axis would be aligned with your A-phase magnetic axis and you can then initialize your vector control at zero degrees and start the procedure. Uh, if you look at most of the industrial drives that you can buy, at least some expensive ones, uh, something about $200, $300, there'd always be something called a hall sensor inside the rotor. So the one of the disadvantage of doing the method that I mentioned right now is uh, stay again, your, this is an assembly line and uh, you stopped your assembly line uh, at the end of the day and you went home and to, next day you come and start the motor. Uh, you don't want uh, to you know initialize to zero the assembly arm which was at some position. You don't want to suddenly jolt and come to some other position uh, just so that you can initialize your vector. So to prevent that, uh, most motors would provide something called halt sensor uh, inside their uh, motor. So what they essentially do is they measure the position, they measure the magnetic uh, linkage uh, along that particular axis. So when you turn on, uh, and they discretize this so that when the magnetic flux is maximum, it gives you one. And uh, when the magnetic flux reverses, when it's positive, it gives you one. And when it reverses, it gives you zero. So you install a flux sensor, a hall sensor along A phase, B phase, and C phase. And depending on where the rotary A position is, you would either get uh, 100 zero zero or 110101. So you would get all those uh, six combinations. It can't be 000, zero, zero it can't be 111. So you'll get the six combination from which you can establish angle within a resolution of 60 degree. And uh, if it's an end pole, more poles, uh, then you can have more hall sensors and further tone down the, the resolution of the rotor position by, uh, so if it's two pole pair, it'll be 60 degree. If it's four pole pair, you can, four poles, it would be 30 degrees. Eight poles, you can res re reduce the resolution to 15 degrees. So once you know, you, uh, you can start your vector control with an approximate, say it's at 15 degrees or 7.5 degrees, and you can start it from there. Or you can excite the nearest phase so that it aligns by just seven degrees instead of swinging all the way from zero to 90 degrees. So th those are the ways in which uh, you need to initialize your rotor position before you can do vector control on a permanent magnet motor. And that's the only difference between vector control of a uh, induction motor and a permanent magnet motor. Other than of course the reduction of two dimensions because of fixed rotor, fixed uh, magnets. Uh, this is the other difference that you need to do a rotor in it. So if you look at the models that we have shared online uh, in the Workbench software, you will see that there is always a rotor in it function. So you go to your model and you set rotor in it and you then you run the rotor initialization. So the rotor would initially jolt a little bit. If it's not aligned a, along A phase, it will move a little bit so that it aligns itself. And then you go back and uh, then set the model file as the run file, which is this file. And then you can start your vector control where the vector control would have assumed that the initial angle is um, uh, zero degrees. So that should be somewhere here if you look at the, yeah. So AV, AQB position, this encoder position initially would give you a value of zero. So you need to pre-align it before doing that. So with that, uh, let's conclude uh, this half of the session as well. Uh, if uh, anybody has any questions, uh, let me know and uh, I can reply to them. I'll hang around for another five to 10 minutes. If anybody has any questions, I'll reply to those before leaving. And um, we'll meet back uh, again at 1.30 central time in two hours, two and a half, two hours, 15 minutes. And when we get back, uh, Professor Mohan would give a, a summary of all the three, of what we learned in the last two days, the advanced vector control, the vector control topics, direct talk controls, uh, induction motor permanent magnet control, DFIG, all of those Professor Mohan would uh, give a nice summary that you can uh, understand pretty easily. All right, um, if you have any questions, let me know and I'll reply to them. Thank you, bye-bye.